אתה יודע כמה שנים לא מחקתי לוח עם גיר? רק בגלל זה אני רוצה. לוח וגיר, מפה על הקיר. בתואר ראשון, נקראת את קלזון? איפה כאן? לא, בתל אביב. לא, לא עברתי בתל אביב בשום שלב, אז חיי היה כזה משלב משבט שרדינגר, הגענו לשיעור, אמר, ביקש ממנו לדחות את הלוח, ואמר, אם אתה מוצא את משבט שרדינגר, תשאיר אותה. זה מקרה. זה משפט טוב, אני גם אגיד. אוקיי, you need help? אה, Which one? There are two. That is better? Only goes in each one. Both of them are. Oh, Hashmi Yonatan. How are you? Maybe that will be the same. I haven't had lessons like you. Let's speak in the Greek, how we come together. Yeah. Um, yeah, we were just talking about how weak measurements is all bullshit, so you know, I thought we could start there and work our way down. Okay, that's the truth. <laughs> <laughs> you think you're joking, but you're not. Hey, oh, how do you feel about classical entanglement? That's the real religious test. Well, um, since I have a paper on it, you mean? Yeah. yeah I, we already had the paper. Well, you read Bob's paper, you know, uh, bashing uh, it. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. But there was a mooring proposal that came. 1.5 million a year for class, 1.25 million a year for classical entanglement. I said, I need to retire. Okay, it's working good. Is it purple or? I was no bird. Is it white or purple? You said that it's some... Yeah. No, the initial is to have the cable. He's in charge of my skin. Okay, I have no idea what's going on. He's not. But there are dinners and other things going on. Can everyone get together? Say it again. Can we all get together? Let's do it in the room. It depends on the day. Right. Because I'm, I'm, I'm here teaching a class, and so I have to prepare 60 slides for my three-hour lecture on Monday. But I'm, I'm not a boss of my own time. Can you take the boy skiing or better now? Huh? I, I just, I just. You want better? Um, so now I'm going to say okay. things that... John, you're, you're on five, you can stop. That, that's okay. Actually, this is good because Nadav is not here, but when I need help on the time frames of the uh, Hangul Mandel, the, all of the stuff I know about these time, coherence times from Hangul Mandel, I got from your notes. So if I get stuck, I'm calling on you. And you, you have to ask the students in the corner to turn the lights on and off. You, you think I'm kidding? I, I said, who here knows about uh, coherence tomography? And the dog cuts raises and I go, go to the board and explain, because I was going to talk about quantum coherence tomography, but I was, yeah, I thought he could do a better job of the classical. Okay. Only five minutes today. A guy always blames me, and he's on the phone, and I'm standing by the door with my bag, and he says, it's your, your fault we're late. So this is all you missed, John. But the notes are online. If you go here, where's the guy in the uniform? Did I scare him away? Yeah. If you go here, all of my slides in the reference papers are all there. You just download them. So we just finished this, and we're going to do these two guys today. And I'm reversing these two because we have people coming on American Friday, which Thursday. is Israeli Thursday, <laughs> and uh, they want a completely new talk because they weren't happy that I give 14 hours of talk, I should prepare additional talks. So uh, I'm going to talk about networks of sensors on Thursday, and I'll do this tomorrow.
registered students, blah, 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 blah. This is your world. This is the wrong slide. Oh, it's Sunday. I clicked on Sunday. But it's periodic. Sorry. It is Sunday, but the wrong Sunday. This Sunday. So you can see all those files there. They're all online. That's the right Sunday. I thought these slides look very familiar. Okay, so this is what we're going to talk about today. As I catch my breath. So, uh, most of the focus of last week's talk, I was, since John Howell was not here, Nicholson and, uh, interferometers, Monxender interferometers, moon states, all of this kind of stuff that the optics people know. So I'm going to try to use the quantum Rosetta Stone to translate everything we learned in optical interferometry to clocks, gravity sensors, and magnetometers. And uh, so that's the hope is that since you were all at my talks last week, and then with some simple hand-waving magic, it's almost the same talk as last week with, with slightly different pictures. Okay, well, the math is the same. The physics must be the same. All right. So one thing I'm going to start with. Where's Kiefer? Over there. Kiefer. 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 Kiefer is a kind of yogurt, right? In the U.S. This is how Actually, the name of the yogurt is the land. Kiefer is also yogurt. Yeah, Kiefer. Okay, the yogurt. So there were several questions about this. So I'm going to do my best, and then if I stall, John Howell will, will take over. So w w I, I was talking about quantum coherence tomography. And I wanted to just mention that you get a factor of lambda over 2 improvement in resolution because of the Hong Ho Mandel 2002 state, right? And then I just said, also, you get dispersion cancellation, which was not the topic of the talk. And everybody came up to me, how does that work? We're really okay. So now I will try to. So the best paper, I think, is theory is this one, all the way back in 1992. All right. So here's the idea. You have the magic crystal. You pump it with a UV, and you get your signal and idler, which, as we recall, for weak pumping limit is one photon here and one photon here, right? And remember the Hong Ho Mandel dance? It, uh, it, this one and that one cancels, so you only get this plus this, right? Pretend I'm not here, John. I, I am. I, I, um. I am pretending you're not here. No, you know, when I first taught this in class, I was confused by the, there's lots of different times, the coherence time, the correlation time, and, and I emailed you, and, and if, uh, so it's an interesting, uh, uh, well, I, I'll just say that uh, I was confused by all of these times. If you don't get them all right, you don't get the Hong Kong Mandel effect right. And, Howell, in his notes online, he said, read my notes. I have it all sorted out there. So this is my Bible for on moment. OK, so what is dispersion? OK, we have a piece of glass here. And as you might know from optics, uh, the uh, speed of light through a material is uh, proportional to the uh, uh, index of refraction, which is a function of frequency. Okay, so different frequencies of light move at different speeds through glass. Okay, red uh, for ordinary dispersion, red moves faster, blue moves slower. Uh, you can have uh, what is the opposite of ordinary? Extraordinary. Extraordinary dispersion. No, it's not. It's something else. But the, the blue moves faster and the red moves slower. No, they're called ordinary and extraordinary. Is it really? Oh. Who knew? Okay, so. So the idea is we put a piece of glass, and the, the point is, and I have a thing on the next, you have a pulse with different frequencies, narrow pulse, and this was in the coherence tomography, but the red frequencies are going to move a little faster, the blue are going to move, and spreads, that's dispersion, okay? And remember when tomography, the, the, uh, the width of the pulse is my knife edge, tomo means to cut in Greek, Greek I think. So my knife edge becomes dull as it moves through the eyeball, which was the co coherence tomography. All right, so instead of an eyeball, it's difficult to experiment with the, uh, 
you have to have the students sign extra paperwork to put their eyeball here. We're going to put a piece of glass, and then we have this translatable mirror. But this is very much like the coherence tomography. It's upside down. This was the eyeball. We're looking at different depths in the eyeball, and this is the control. Okay. And then we have the Hangul Mandel effect here, and then we do our counting. So let's a little bit more about dispersion. The pump photon is typically UV, and then the daughter photons, the signal at neither, we're going to assume they're at the same omega knots, which is half the pump, because I have a purple photon going in. So wavelength divided by two are the daughter photons. And we'll say that they're the same for simplicity. But there's some spread in the frequency. Uh, each daughter photon is omega naught, plus or minus some delta omega, which is the bandwidth. But if that bandwidth is narrow, it's well peaked around omega naught for each signal and either photon, then you can expand the wave vector in a Taylor series. So you keep this first term, the second term proportional to frequency, and this is the one that we're interested in. This is the one, the second order dispersion that causes the spreading of the wave packet. Okay. So uh, this one just corresponds to index of refraction, right? That's the first term. Well, that, that gives you your group velocity. That gives you the group velocity. <coughs> oh, you're right, right. This is index of refraction. This is group velocity, and this is dispersion in the group velocity. Okay. So speaking of group velocity from uh, optics 101, or your e &M course, derivative of the frequency with respect to k. In free space, of course, you get c, which is the speed of light. But inside of a material, it depends on the index of refraction, which we just, uh, which we just expanded out of the Taylor series. So we have, this is the approximation, but keep your eye on this. This is the, the spreading term. All right. So the dispersion contributes a broadening that's uh, 2 times the Delta omega is your bandwidth around each photon, okay. Beta is the second order term in the expansion, and D is the, the length of the, the piece of glass that you're going through. So this is what it looks like for uh, pulse board broadening. Uh, for typical dispersion, the red, so you imagine this is blue here and red here. The red go a little fast, the blues go a little slow, and so it spreads. Now, if I'm talking about a classical pulse, then you imagine the classical pulse is made of, you know, laser pointer 10 to the 6, 10 to the 8 photons. And you think classically, well, some of the photons are blue, and some of the photons are red, and they spread. But this pulse contains only one photon. So it's not correct to think, think that the photon sometimes is red and sometimes is blue. The single photon is in a superposition of red and blue. That's quantum mechanics, right? So what does that mean? If I have a detector that's frequency sensitive, and I, say, I measure the photon, and I say, what is the wavelength of the photon? On average, it'll be this green-yellow thing. But sometimes it'll be a little redder, it'll collapse to red. And sometimes it'll be a little bluer, it'll collapse to blue, with the mean frequency centered here. So that's different than classical mechanics, which says the light, you know, there are many photons with different frequencies. There's one photon in the superposition, superposition of many frequencies. But now you have this opposite that's a positive chirp. Ah, this is what I'm looking for. Positive chirp uh, is the ordinary diffraction, I'm mean, sorry, uh, uh, the ordinary dispersion. Red goes faster than blue. But you can have a negative chirp, okay, where the blue goes faster than red in some materials. So I'm thinking like that formally when I write a photon's wave function for how do you, is, are the frequencies always quantized? Not necessarily. But I typically would write a photon wave function as some, it's a Gaussian, right? Okay. So it has a mean frequency omega, not. Okay. And then there's a spread delta of omega. Okay. So typically what you do is you write something like this. There's a function, uh, I'm going to write it kind of sloppy, okay? So this is a function f, which is my Gaussian function. And uh, I imagine that this is, uh, and then I'm going to put the omega here. So it, the notation is horrible, but the idea is, is that it's in a superposition of all of these different frequencies with the central frequency 
is this is the the Gaussian P. I can make other sorts of photon wave packets uh, other than Gaussians, but this is kind of but when I integrate it all up, I only get one photon. I don't get a bunch. Okay, so understanding that is the first critical point. The photon has a spread in frequency, but it is in a superposition of different frequencies. Okay, so here is the critical thing you need to know about the parametric down conversion. So when the two photons come out, one of these days I'm going to fall on these fossils and become a fossil. Did you, did you know, John, there's fossils on the floor here? There are actual fossils in the limestone. You can see leaves and bugs. I will become a fossil myself. Okay, so the, the point is, well, I, actually, I don't need to write this. It'll come in a second. I'll just stand here. Perfect. So there's my wave function, okay. And so the point is with the, let me go to the wave function and go back. So there's two photons, a signal and either, right? I just wrote the equation for one. Now we're going to have two. The frequencies are now correlated, okay? So each signal and idler has a central frequency, omega naught. But if the signal has blue here and red here, the idler has blue here, and they're anti-correlated in their frequencies, okay? So, and that's the plus and the minus. So if, I'm, if I do experiments and I measure the frequencies of these two guys together, okay? If I measure just one, like I told you, sometimes it'll measure a little red, sometimes a little blue, okay? If I measure this one, sometimes a little red, sometimes a little blue. But if I measure them in coincidence and correlation, if this one's a little red, this one is always a little blue. If this one's a little red, this one's always a little blue. They're anti-correlated. And that's the critical feature that gives rise to the dispersion cancellation. So that's the plus and minus here, okay? If one is reddish, the other is bluish, but you don't know which is which until you make a measurement. So you have to write down the, uh, the entire diagram in terms of a superposition, like with Feynman diagrams. Okay. So here is the picture from that paper by Chow and all. So you, here's the UV. This is the wave packet for one photon, the wave packet for the other photon. It goes through the thing and maybe spreads due to dispersion. And then you have your Hongo mandel where they we do the little dance. They stick or they don't stick. And the, what you're supposed to get away from this is that think of these as like two Feynman diagrams. There's one Feynman diagram. This is tr where they both are transmitted. That goes there. That goes there. There's another Feynman diagram where this one is reflected and they are both reflected. And you have to add these coherently, superimpose them. Okay. And once again, remember, you don't know in principle if this one is reddish and that one's bluish or the reverse, so that comes into play as well. So when you put it all together, uh, let me go back to the picture again. So and again, this, is, this was very tough for me to understand. In 1992, I was a postdoc, and I had to read through, I read through Franson's paper, which was incomprehensible. I read through this one, which was almost as incomprehensible. But the picture then is that since you don't know, in principle, if this is blue and that's red, or if this is red and that's blue, the uh, dispersion says, remember the chirp says, uh, positive chirp says red gets ahead, blue is behind. Negative chirp says, negative chirp, you know, okay. Negative <laughs> chirp, blue is ahead, red gets behind. But you would superimpose these and neither gets ahead and neither gets behind, and you get cancellation of the second order dispersion. So that's the idea. So when this guy and this guy are superimposed in this funky looking interferometer, the effect of the dispersion cancels out, okay, because of this correlation between the frequencies and you only have two photons. So I, I can't do better than that. I suppose I should ask Dr. Hall at some future point to give a lecture on this. A lot of people are very interested in this, and. I think of this as old stuff, right? Um, but, you know, the idea is that you can actually, and then in, in the coherence tomography, which is measuring the eyeball, you've got two things, lambda over two improvement in resolution, but also the dispersion cancellation. And the dispersion makes your pulses wide, which means your knife edge for looking at the layers in the eyeball uh, becomes dull. And so all of these papers are uploaded. 
So here is the ex experiment. I think this is the experiment, okay? And measurement, and then here is the, I, I had a reference to the coherence demography paper. I stuck it online, do you can download that. So my hope is if you read all three of these papers and think about it, you'll get the point. Right, John? I'm not supposed to look at you. Why am I not supposed to look at you? You've gotten older. I noticed some gray hair. <laughs> yes, that's, that's a couple of times. Yes. Professor Howell and I are friends from about 1992. How old were you in 92? Uh, I was in college. Okay, maybe shortly after that. Okay, so that's John, the... John? Yeah. Can you go to the picture where you have been both transmitted and uh, reflected this one? Yeah. Is it true to say that the lower amplitude of the upper picture actually interferes with the upper amplitude of the lower and vice versa? So Is when that you true, a, John? <laughs> when you have a non-local interference, yeah, yeah, you get one option interfering from the other option, from, but from the other... Right. From the, the other, yeah. other possibility. Right. So the two... And, 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 and the Hong Kong Mandel bit is important because when you combine them, you end up with this minus sign between the two, so the positive dispersion and the negative dispersion cancel out, leaving no dispersion at all. And I, I don't have a better picture for this. You can go, go through the calculation and you get the, the same answer. So it's kind of a, it's quantum mechanics, you know. It's we once tried to understand if it works for pulses, like you drew here, but somehow this, this experiment doesn't work for pulses. It only works for CW, uh, for CW something, because you get some, some amplitudes have to inter interfere with things that arrive in a different time. Right, and, and if you want it, the Bible for those arrival times, you read John Howe's notes. But he's is, nodding one of what I'm saying. Which is the first time I got all the, because if you don't get the time scales right, there's the coherence time of the pump, there is the femto, hundreds of femtosecond uh, separation between the down converted but photons, working with pulses, which is due to a virtual trend. It doesn't work with pulses. It doesn't work with pulses. You have to have perfect time correlations. Right. You have to have perfect spectral correlations in order for it to work. Perfect spectral correlations and also time of arrival because well, of the on, on, the, on the beams. Yeah. Right. But you know, the, 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 the pump, the coherence length of the pump is meters huge, right? Because it's a very narrow thing. Uh, so that means so like nanoseconds, you know, milliseconds coherence length. But the two photons, I don't really talk about a coherence length of either photon. But they arrive at the mirror within a few hundred femtoseconds of each other. So much, much smaller than na nanoseconds. So this could be used uh, by lining these guys up until you see the Hong Mandel effect. You can align the two arms of the interferometer to within uh, 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 100 femtoseconds, which is how many much centimeters? Less, much less. Much less. Much, much, yeah, if you integrate, you much less. less. No, no, you can get one femto. sub attosecond. sub attosecond. okay, great. At least femtosecond. So th there's a funny story that Hong O oh, and Mandel actually were not the first to think of this. Yuan Hua Shi and uh, Carol Alley at University of Maryland actually discovered this first and they published it in like an abstract in the APS, uh, back in those days you could publish an abstract. I think it was an APS meeting abstract. And they said, oh, it's a cool way to align the arms of the interferometer to within, you know, sub femto pico attosecond. But, but Mandel instead made a big deal about core, uh, quantum interference and single photon and all of that, and he got into PRL. So you might, instead of Hong O Mandel, that might be the Hong O Mandel Xi Ali effect, which you have to at least put that if Xi or Ali are in the room. Ali Xi. Ali Xi. That sounds like Ali yeah. G. And is Ali still around? He must be 137 years old now. Anyway, don't get on Ali's bad side. That's another story. So it's this complicated interference between the frequencies and also between the. It has to do with the bosonic nature of the overlap of the wave function. But it works, and these are some experimental stuff. And uh, Kiefer, you were asking about this, so this is your home. I, you are registered for the course, yes? Yes. This is your report, your two-page report, what I learned about dispersion, okay? And, I'll be, and I want that one in English, not Hebrew. Okay. Right. And, and this is the coherence demography. Uh-huh. And for that to be practical in eye surgery, you need a very bright source of moon states? That's the other problem, right? So the, uh, 
taking us back to all of these things with noon states, this is very low flux, right? Okay, so bright source, or you have to integrate for a long, 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 long time, okay, to accumulate the same statistics as doing it uh, classically. But remember, classically, I get this dispersion. Uh, which I don't get quantum mechanically. And if I have the luxury to integrate, and your eyeball doesn't move very fast, or I'm looking at something else, I've actually seen proposals where they want to use the Cohen's coherence tomography uh, in uh, IR correlated photons to look for defects in computer chips. So the photons are below the band gap of the semiconductor material, and they're essentially looking for, instead of eyeball, put a computer chip and there are many layers in the computer chip that look for defects, okay? And there the, the chip isn't changing, and, and you can integrate as long as you want, okay? And, and then back, to, I think I mentioned this before, if you're looking at bacteria or something like this, maybe you don't want to blast the hell out of it with the pump laser because uh, you'll cook it. But uh, using this technique, you get the same resolution uh, at very low power. Okay. So this was not meant to be part of the, the talk, but you know, nice thing is people ask questions, they go, well, let's talk about this for a little bit. And Professor Howell is the expert on the time scale, so you can go knock on his office door during office hour. Okay, so the, we're in the Middle East. The Rosetta Stone was found in a town in Egypt, which in English is Rosetta, I don't know what it is in Arabic, okay. Rashid. What? Rashid. A, sh a ship? Rashid. Rashid. I heard a ship. No, it's not a ship. It was found in the ground, not a ship. And it was actually, had it been recycled from some other previous demolition, it was being used to held up a piece of a building that had also collapsed, okay? And, and I think on here, there's somebody's victory over somebody. No, no, not Napoleon. It's older. But Napoleon didn't write this. No. Napoleon it discovered not, it, yeah. Yes. But what does it say? Somebody... One hour war. Who? It's not a war. It's, it's, it's written in Latin. Yeah, but what does it say? What does it say? No, it's not a war. It's about Egyptian, yeah, the Egyptian victory over somebody. I, I don't remember. I don't think it was the Jews this time. But the, yeah. I, I it in any case, it says it's it's some it's Egyptian true. guy won a, won a battle, and this is an announcement about winning the battle. And you have to realize how this hard this was to find because it was put up on a wall someplace and that building was knocked down and then they took this as a brick in another building and, and somebody looked at it and said, this is cool, Napoleon, and transported it back. It was Napoleon. Napoleon found it, one of his guys. And the critical thing was is that they had all this hieroglyphics, hieroglyphics in the pyramids and it had no way to interpret them. So in this, there are three languages, Greek, hieroglyphics, and demotic. I don't know what is demotic, but the point is, is that now they had a few hieroglyphics, they had a secret decoder, and they were able to decode a few of the hieroglyphics, and then from there they were able to figure the rest out. So without this, no hieroglyphics. That's the famous Rosetta Stone. So, same thing here, we have our own Rosetta Stone, that using a Mach Zender, I can, using an atomic clock, or a generic quantum circuit, I can decode the Mach Zender interferometer, or I can use this to decode this, or that to decode that, or any different combination. So we published this paper, and the title of the paper was The Quantum Rosetta Stone. And the referee said, came back and said, I like the paper, but I don't like the title, Quantum Rosetta Stone. Rosetta Stone should be only for something very important, like the original Rosetta Stone. Okay. So then I wrote back and said, well, you have Rosetta, Rosetta Stone is a, a CDs that you can use to learn a foreign language. And then I found a, a, a British boy band, a pop band from the 1970s, and they're like these scrawny little boys playing guitars with those shirts on, called the Rosetta Stone. So I put this in my refer reply to the referee. The photo. So the referee then gives me the knife in the stomach. He says, I agree that Rosetta Stone is not important just like this paper so publish. Uh, okay, but there it is. We got the name inside of the uh, paper, and it's downloaded here. But the idea, we go through some calculations. But the point is, is that I've been speaking for one week on Monsanto interferometers, 
the math of a Mach center interferometer is identical to the math that we're going to now describe in atomic clock and some other uh, spin-based uh, uh, quantum sensors. Since we already know this, we must know this. And, and this was also a key that the beam splitters here are Hadamard gates in quantum computing language, okay? And remember I said maybe on the first day, a quantum computer is a giant interferometer with entangled particles that does calculations better than you can do classically. A quantum sensor is a giant interferometer with entangled particles that measures things better than you can do classically. So if you have a quantum computer, you can just adjust a few knobs and turn it into a quantum sensor, a Mach-Zender interferometer, or to an atomic clock. And using ideas from quantum computing, you can make better atomic clocks and better Mach-Zenders. So we'll end with that. All right. So the formal equivalence, this is just what I said. And there's the picture one more time. <coughs> so this is what we don't know about, but I'm going to uh, connect these two guys, and hopefully everybody will be happy. So here's an atomic clock. So every GPS satellite has four atomic clocks when launched. Uh, I used to think that was because you have one was for X, one was for Y, one was for Z, and one was for D. No, when one burns up, they just the, they, they're, they're three backups to the primary atomic clock. And GPS broadcasts on your phone for, when you're using Waze, right? Very accurate time information and the position of the satellite. So if you have four satellites in view and you have a good GPS receiver, you can get your lot of, uh, blah, blah, longitude and latitude, X and Y, which is good for driving, to within plus or minus a few meters. Not good enough for landing a plane. If you miss the runway, but plus or minus three meters, you're in trouble. But the exit's fine. And if you integrate long enough, you also get timing information. In fact, we were having the discussion that it, you know in Israel and many other countries, when people are trying to get accurate timing information from point A to point B, they simply put a GPS receiver on the roof and integrate the signal, and then they have atomic clock and timing accuracy synchronized to the GPS satellites. So one of the questions uh, that Mafat asks is like, what if the GPS goes down? How are we going to transfer timing information? So I'll give you one more story about this timing. So I had a Garmin GPS receiver. When I moved from Los Angeles to Louisiana, in Los Angeles, we have earthquakes. So when I look for a place, I have earthquake maps, where are the earthquakes? And so I don't want to buy a house uh, where the earthquakes will cause damage. In Louisiana, no earthquakes, but floods. So I have a flood map, okay? And most of Louisiana is at or below sea level. So I did some rough calculations and said, I will not be below 40 feet above sea level, okay? Which is one of the highest points in, in Baton Rouge. <laughs> so each time I would arrive at a house, I had a real estate agent show me the house. I would set my GPS receiver to calibrate the time on the front porch. And then she would show me the house, it's nice, it has chandelier, three bedrooms, a place for the dogs. And, and then I come back and go, no, it's lower than 40 feet the next one. She goes, why don't you tell me that right away? And I go, well, it has to integrate the signal to, to get good accuracy. And so that was she she, understood it. No, she, she resigned from her job and retired. Like, so. But cesium clocks, you know, one second and 300 years accuracy, and that's only back to 1955. Okay. So the way that the atomic clock works, I'm going to go through this in some detail. So here's a cesium atom, okay, which is our time standard. And we, we throw the cesium atoms through a device. It applies a microwave pulse, high over two pulse, which is my beam splitter in the Rosetta Stone. And then this thing evolves in time, and it picks up a phase. The phase in the Mach-Zender interferometer was my gravity wave or whatever here. The phase is the accumulated time. Then I hit it with a second pi over two radio wave pulse. And what does that mean, pi over two? The area of the pulse in some units is designed to take a ground state atom and put it into an equal superposition of ground state and excited state. It's called a pi pulse because I will show you in a second. And then over here, once you, you make it, after the second pi pulse, some of the atoms are now, you, they all start out in the ground state. Some are excited, some are uh, not in the ground state. The ratio tells you how much time has elapsed between the pulses, and that's how you get your clock. All right, so here's my PowerPoint representation of the previous figure. So the box produces atoms in the ground state. The first pi pulse 
puts it into an equal superposition, okay? And this arrow rotates and accumulates phase. But now phase, instead of being proportional to some uh, displacement in the mod center in a parameter, is proportional to the elapsed time, which is what we're trying to make uh, with a clock, okay? And then I apply the second pipe pulse. First pipe pulse is the first beam splitter in the mod zender. The analogy is that if the spin is pointing down, it means the photon came in the lower port of the mod zender. Spin is pointing up, it means the photon came in the upper port. Pi over two pulse is the mod zender. My accumulated phase is inside here. Second pi over two pulse is the second beam splitter. And then I make a measurement. If it's spin up, I measure here. If it's spin down, I measure with this detector. That's the same as saying if it was uh, came out the upper port, I measure here and the lower port. Of it. The math is exactly the same. So I'm a theoretical physicist that so the math is the same, the physics is the same. All right, so here is actually, I, I'm trying to find some good Ramsey fringes. Best ones I could find quickly from Ben Gurion University. This is Ron Folman's group. They make the little atomic clocks on a chip. So the, the, the numbers are a little different than what I had from before. But you see this interference fringe as a function of time, okay? So what's going on is that I'm measuring how many atoms are excited and how many are uh, in ground state coming out. And this is the probability of excited, this is probability of ground. Just like in the Mount Center, I take the difference of the two signals at the two detectors, and I get a cosine of phi curve, okay, that looks like this. So if I measure the peak from here, to here, which is one oscillation, okay, that is uh, uh, in cesium, cesium clocks, there is so many thousand uh, exact periods in a second. That's the definition of the second. So one oscillation is something like a billionth of a second, so I can measure time by staring at this to one billionth of a second or even better, okay, by just looking at these interference fringes. So instead of measuring gravity waves, I'm measuring time. It's this, the thing is about this big, LIGO is four kilometers long, it doesn't matter, the math is the same. Okay. And notice the fringes begin to decay. Okay. Well, that's because of something called dephasing, which we'll talk about in a, in a while. But I mentioned this also in the mod sender, if you have loss or dephasing, the fringe visibility goes down. Remember, your accuracy is related to how steep is the slope. The steeper the slope, the more I can tell that the time has changed. So as it starts to decay, the slope gets worse and worse, and you, it's uh, limited. After a few oscillations, you don't see any. Uh, after a few uh, periods, you don't see any oscillations. So we're going to try to fix that. Okay. So the Rosetta Stone says uh, my interferometer and atomic clock are the same, but they're also the same as a single, simple single qubit gate. Okay, uh, gate sequence. So, uh, if you've not had quantum computing, this is a qubit. A qubit is a two-level system. So, a two-level system can be our atom excited in ground state, or in the Monsender, it could be the photon comes in the down port or the up port. Those are the mathematically same things, okay? And the qubit is a vector in a two-dimensional sphere. This is the block, the block sphere, if you want to call it that. And I will curse the computer scientists until the day I die because I always would want this one to be the ground state and this one to be the excited state, but they chose the reverse. And so the one that points up is the ground state and the one that points down is the excited state. And so there are lots of typos where I forget where the heck I am, but they will just blame the computer scientists. Okay, so the ground state is a zero and uh, the excited state is a one. And the idea is that this vector that defines the qubit is some superposition of zero and one. It has an azimuthal angle, and then it has uh, azimuthal angles this way, and this is elevation, and uh, longitudinal angle, okay. And so the qubit can be anywhere onto this, this sphere, okay. So once I say qubit, it's a quantum computer. So quantum computer, Munzener interferometer, atomic clock, they're all the same. Okay, so let's redo the quantum uh, Ramsey interferometer, the atomic clock, in terms of qubits. Okay, so we start with the qubit in the ground state, which means it points up. Don't blame me at the computer scientists, okay? Ground state is here. Then we hit it with the pi over two pulse, which is like a beam splitter. And what that does is the atom is in the ground state. Pi over two pulse does exactly what you might think. In theta, it rotates it by pi over two, right? This would be pi. 
This is pi over 2. Everybody with me? Is the elementary geometry? Once it's in here, it's in a superposition of excited and ground state. And it begins to rotate in the equator at a particular angular rate. That angular rate, forgive me, in, 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 I'm stealing these images off of the internet. So in one picture they say the time phase is phi, the other one they say theta. So theta is equal to phi, okay. But the point is it's rotating around at what period? The period given by the number of oscillations in a cesium atom, which is 100 billion blah, 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 exact integer number of oscillations per second. And then I apply the second pi over two poles, which is like the second beam splitter, and the qubit now is in a superposition of up and down simultaneously. Okay? And what the probability that it's up and the probability that it's down is given by this is sine squared of phi, and this is cosine squared of phi, just like with the <coughs> moxeter. And when I finally make a measurement, it collapses to up or to down with that same probability. And so by measuring the number of guys that collapse up and the number of guys that collapse down, I can estimate the elapsed time between the two pi pulses. That's a rough way of the, the way the atomic clock works. Okay, so here's the Rosetta Stone back in action. Okay, state preparation. This is ground state, or photon comes in this arm. Same thing. Pi over two pulse is beam splitter here, or this radio wave pulse. But the qubit language is the same. Now it rotates around the equator. Here it's picking up gravity waves. Here it's picking up time. Okay. Second pi over two pulse is exactly like a beam splitter again, and then you measure the up and down, and uh, those two guys, usually you subtract them, you remember we do difference measuring, so sine squared minus cosine squared is equal to mm -hmm, sine squared phi over two minus cosine squared phi over two, which is minus, minus cosine, cosine two, phi. phi, yeah. And so yeah. there's reasons, technical reasons, you like to do the differencing, it gets rid of uh, common mode noise and so forth. Same as before. Okay, so back to the Rosetta Stone, we started with this, we said, okay, what's a qubit, and then we said, oh, it's a lot like an atomic clock. All right, so let's use the Dirac notation. I'm trying not to scare the undergrads. Who, have you seen this Dirac notation? Yeah. So my undergrads are not the same as the Israeli undergrads. So no undergrad, second year undergrad? Or something. Third? You might have seen direct notation. I teach direct notation to the sophomores, but they, they, nobody else does. Okay, so here is the ground state pointing down, which means it's on the top of the sphere, okay? The pi over two poles puts it into an equal superposition. There's a factor of square root of two, but remember on the first lecture, I said square root of two equal to one. Yeah, okay. Which is all the computer scientists do. So now it's popped up onto the equator. And then it begins to evolve in time by oscillating around the equator, picking up a phi's phi. And then it's in a superposition of these two guys. You apply the second pi pulse, and then you make a measurement. It collapses to excited, sine squared. There's a phi over two here. I'm missing a phi over two. And, but, I, but I've already said square root of two equal to one. So if you square both sides of that equation, you get two is equal to one. Okay, so first. And I also said, 2 pi is equal to 1 for the Fourier transforms. I mean, and I set all of them equal to h bar equal g equals c equals what? Howell's giving me. Everybody else liked it. Howell's giving me this look like it. Okay. Anyway, so right here, it's now, it's still, it's in a superposition of sine phi and cosine phi. When I make a measurement, it collapses with a probability, the sine squared, or a probability cosine squared down. And I difference them, and I get the Ramsey fringes which are the measurement of elapsed time. Okay. So that's exactly what we saw with the max there. So with the max under the parameter, I introduced you to the noon states. I said, well, if we had a magic <coughs> beam splitter and I could make entangled states of the photon n, zero, zero, n, okay, then I get an improvement in signal to noise and super resolution. So the analogy then, I go through the, the uh, Rosetta Stone, if I can make entangled states of photons in a mod zender in the <coughs> mathematically I can use the same technique to make entangled states of atoms in the atomic clock and also get super resolution and better than shot noise sensitivity. 
So you, I already taught this to you, so it's, the math is exactly the same. What I need now is the equivalent of a, that I should be up, okay? It's not, yeah. It's not one of the yeah, but This one is right, and I copied and pasted this one, but somehow it's okay, but the, that's the correct one. So here you have a product of a bunch of separate qubits or a bunch of separate atoms, all accumulating time phase uh, separately. And even if I think about the law of large numbers, if I have a bunch of different sensors and I average the result, the improvement is only goes like the square root of the number of sensors, square root of n, which is our shot noise, another way to look at it. Well, what I really want is this. Remember the, Nunes, the analog of the noon state, it's n, 0, 0, 0, 0, n. <coughs> Here the notation has changed slightly for simplification, but I want all of the spins collectively to be up for n atoms or and to be collectively down. This is called a GHZ state, not for gigahertz, but for uh, Greenberger, Horn, and Zeilinger, who invented this state. The problem is, is that if I get onto Google and I Google GHZ state, I only get gigahertz, so I have to put you know something else in there. Okay? But all spins up and all spins down. How the heck do I do that? Okay, we go find this paper. This is 19, uh, and the reference comes up late, sooner than later. But this is what we did with the uh, noon space, okay? I had a uh, two, I did it in the polarization basis, just like uh, the uh, uh, Mandel's experiment. I have two polarized H. I apply a Hadamard, okay, which is a beam splitter in the optics, and then a controlled knot gate, which I don't have. I can do it with nonlinear optics or I can do it with the projected measurements that give rise to the uh, nonlinear optics. So this was the discussion from last week. But imagine I have some sort of strong nonlinearity between the two photons, so this guy flips polarization dependent on what the state of this guy is. So one of these guys makes an HHVV, okay, which is like the 2002. Remember I said I can take H and V and convert it into uh, from spin uh, polarization mode to spatial mode. And there's our noon state. Okay. So all we do is map this via the Rosetta Stone. <laughs> it's supposed to be two ground state atoms. Yeah, that's 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 one, and that's the other one. So I tend two ground state atoms, okay, which is the up arrow. Instead of a Hadamard, which is a beam splitter, I apply a pi over two poles, which is the analog of the Hadamard for the clock. Now. Here, the control knot gate is somewhat easier because in ion trap atomic clocks, the uh, ions, which are my spins, are coupled via phonon modes inside of the ion trap, which gives us rise to uh, a nonlinearity. So you can actually make a pretty good control knot gate between two ions and an ion trap. So unlike optics, where it's very hard, if I have a, this uh, as, as atomic system, this ionic system, it's pretty easy. Okay, so the idea then is that I could apply the control knot gate. Now I have my evolution, which is time. It's actually easier than that in ion trap. You just apply pi two, pi over two with a microwave horn, blast it, and they're all going to the chaser. You don't need to do any phonons or anything like that. It's much easier. Okay, the ion trap guy tells me it's easier to make this. That's the my that's my point. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, for, for the, uh, the four one, they don't even use control knots. They use the Molnar, Sorensen gate, but this is uh, beyond, the, that's for another lecture. But this is the model that I'm lifting from, you know, the people who are analyzing. This is a paper by uh, Eckert, Pleniel, and a few other guys, 1996, 1998. Okay, so what we do is uh, we do the control knot gate. Now we have the free evolution. But once again, once you fix my notation, you get a 2 phi instead of a phi, right? Because there's 2 up and 2 down. Just like my 2, 0, 0, 2 had a 2 phi, I get a 2 phi here. Math is the same. I do a parity measurement, uh, uh, even and odd. If both of them are up, it's even. If one is up and one is down, it's odd. I think that's the correct thing. And then I get a Ramsey fringe that oscillates two times as fast with the narrower fringe spacing. And so I get super resolution in time, but I also get super sensitivity. All right, so that's just for two. What am I going to do? If, so 
I bet you can't do this by just blasting the hell out of it. Okay, so I have n, where n is arbitrary. So if I want to do uh, uh, make it large noon state, I drew a diagram like this before. This would be a beam splitter followed by photonic photonic uh, control not gates. But now it's a pi over two pulse. Notice I'm using the language of quantum computing as a way to decode and translate from the Mach zender to the clock. I mean, that's, that's the point here. Quantum computing gives us a universal language. The Mach zender people and the clock people never talked to each other before 1994. But then when Shor's algorithm came out, they had to go to the same funding agency <coughs> and they had to learn the language of quantum computing. And I think this was one of the most important things that happened in the 1990s. The clock people were speaking Demontic, and the Mogzender people were speaking Greek, but then they discovered the Rosetta Stone and they all began speaking hieroglyphics. I don't know if you can speak hieroglyphics, but they began using the language of quantum computing to describe their experiments to each other so there was a common language. That's also the point of the Rosetta Stone. So I can make an n fold moon state, GHZ state, using this sequence. I take unentangled atoms. Apply a Hadam R to the first one, and controlled not gates. Then I do my free time evolution, now I'm in the middle, and then I reverse it. I flip this around, apply a sequence of controlled not gates that goes d -d 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 up with the final Hadam R to make a parity measurement, and I get uh, super uh, sensitivity in time. So this means my ability, uh -huh, so this is the, the experiment. And this is the theory that I'm looking at for, well, this 97. Okay. So here, this is this, this scheme exactly as I just said. Okay, these are unentangled. You apply Ramsey, free evolution, second Ramsey, pi over two or Hadamard. Uncorrelated particles, no entanglement. Run the numbers, you get one over square root of n to shot noise limit, as we know and hate, I think, because we try to beat it. Okay, but now we do the sequence of uh, uh, controlled not gates, and we convert this independent guys to this one G8Z, and what was, uh, there's a typo. This is supposed to go to 1 over n. I used a very light blue font and you can't see it again. So the unentangled one is 1 over square root of n, and the entangled one is 1 over n. So if n is large, 100, we get an improvement in the ability to measure time by a factor of 10. Okay, that's the promise of the clocks. And here's the experiment for n equal 4, and this is where they use the molnar sorensen gate. Uh, for 2, I, I, I agree, you can just blast the heck out of it and get 2, two, uh, a, a two, two particle GH set. But for 4, you have to do something tricky. So you could apply a sequence of 4 controlled not gates, but then Molmer and Sorensen said, hey, we have a new gate, and if you apply this, you get it in one shot, and it turns out the molnar sorensen gate is easy to make, easier to make than 4 controlled not gates. I'm not going to go into that, but you can see this is what they're doing. Here's the general state that they're making. Here's n equal 1 to singles. It's actually easier to make n equal 4 than it is to make n equals 2 or 3 with the, well, 2 is easy, but that's not interesting. 3 is, uh, 4 is easier than 3. So you can see exactly what we said, right? Oscillates n times as fast. There are, n, there are 4 times as many bumps. They use the parity operator just like we used in the Monsender. Okay, this is the state they're preparing. It's like a noon state, and you run the numbers and you get this factor of a square root of n improvement. Okay, so I'm gonna stop. Does everybody understand the Rosetta Stone? We're now fluent in Greek, Demontic, and hieroglyphics. I think people did not speak hieroglyphics. They wrote in hieroglyphics. They spoke it's Coptic. They spoke in. Coptic, no. Coptic is the same language as ancient Egyptian. Okay, Coptic. Okay. But the, 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 the writing is different. This is the problem. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So everybody got that? So we went from Mach Center to atomic clocks via the quantum computer. Okay, so quantum computer language unifies the field. And it also, and so I'm now going to confess. What is my confession? So. I gave you the Mach Zender first and then the clock. This is not the historical correct order. Okay? We were working on Mach Zenders, and then I was doing literature search, and I found this paper from 1997. So we were looking at noon states 
2000, our lithography paper came out in 2000. And somebody said, you know, this is a paper by plenty of these guys, okay? So we went back and looked at this. And so the, the confession is, is that we got the idea how to make noon states by reading the clock paper, not the other way around. I presented it as if I was first and then came second. But we didn't know how to make noon higher than two. So we looked at this paper. We said, oh, there's a sequence of controlled not gates. It's here. And then we tried to make those, but we can't do that. And then we did the projected measurements and blah, 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 blah. So this, this paper on the combat clock in dangled states inspired us. On the, we looked at the math and said, we must reproduce this in the Monzener interferometer to make the noon states. And that's, that, was, that was my Rosetta Stone. I was only speaking demontic and I did not know hieroglyphics. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, time for a break. Okay. This is a three hour talk, John. When I came to Israel, and the word got around, and then the whites had said, well, we want some talks too. And then Barlon said, well, what about us? And so the plan was that in addition to the 14 hours of talks here, are we gonna be put in the taxi and driven around Israel leading more talks? And I said, no taxis, no more talks, and no lab tour. Good to see you again. Good to see you. What's up? So, do you want a cup of coffee? I'm going to buy them. No, no, I don't. I, 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 the paper you showed with the, with the Momo Swanson book, that was my advisor. Now, I have to say, it would always be easier to apply microwave form because it doesn't matter how many ions you're applying it to, more or less, it's the same thing each time because the wave is, is blast the whole cavity. Mm -hmm. I have no idea what you're saying, but I'm going to not accept it. No, except it would not be easier if you just can't do it. I don't know why they would do this except if the qubit they're using doesn't have a microwave transition. And they're using some transition that microwaves wouldn't work on. Yeah, I, I, you know, I don't know. I think they did it this way because it was cute and it had this quantum computing analog. So this is not a practical, well, I should say, the entangled four particle ion trap clock held a record for the best atomic clock for several years, about five to seven years. Now it's beat out by the all optical clock, okay, but the, this entangled clock was the record holder for a while. So. The, the best ion clocks are the, what they call the like a quantum gate clock. Basically, they have some sort of quantum logic inside. So they use the two different species of ions. I don't remember exactly the mechanism. Yeah. The general view that they it has to do something to overcome the fact that there's more than the bigger end. Right, right. But which, you know, as we know, the bigger the end, the faster the deep phase. But they're still the, uh, on about the same order of magnitude. So, I know Chris Monroe. He was a Wyland's postdoc? Or yeah. yeah. So I used to fund Wineland. So when I worked for the U.S. government, I was on the panel who decided who got money and who didn't get money for quantum computing. And the interesting thing is, is that they were already looking at entanglement before Shore on making better clocks using the phonon interaction. And then, what? Okay. Yeah, yeah, even before. And then when, so I was there in the room when, in 1994. Arthur Eckert gave a talk to Boulder, who was the international conference. Wyland was in the room, Monroe was in the room, Zoller and Serac were in the room, and I was in the room. And Wyland and Monroe went immediately back to the lab and said, we, we can just take our clock pulses and make them into the quantum computer pulses and demonstrate the computer Kimball was there, he did a photon photon feed. And what did I do? I went back to the army and sent the facts saying quantum computing and quantum cryptography is going to be a really big deal. I organized the first conference in 1995. <coughs> and and uh, at that conference, we had all these army guys, and two guys from the NSA. And, and then suddenly, the army had millions of dollars for quantum computing. It was actually laundering the money from the NSA. So if it hadn't been for me, there would have been no army. I take full credit for the entire U.S. program. John, I have some. Yeah. I have something for you. Is this is good, or you're complaining, or you're telling me something? Cute? I'm complaining. You're complaining, but I'm not. Not. Uh, so what you were describing was the prince. Uh, 
That was that was the child paper. So that that was not that was not the uh, so France and France and dispersion cancellation and Oh, okay, okay, okay. The one that makes the most sense to me is the France one because it was served in the anti church That's right. Okay, but the hot is that the the, the child one is a different scheme. Yeah, that's a different scheme. Yeah, I, 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 Okay. So uh, basically, all we come down to. I'm sure you don't want to go back to the snowbird. I hit the snowbird. It wasn't due to the conflict. <laughs> So basically, because you have frequency perfect frequency correlations, you have a CWM then um, what happens is the sum of the two photons is very tight, but the uncertainty in any one is red. And so that, and so what happens is um, if you then get one, that is, <laughs> if if one shifts to the blue. And you have a plus D on one side where that's positive, and then the other side is negative, the chirp of the engine chirp. Then they always arrive at the two detectors at the same time because one will have been delayed in one direction, one will have been advanced the other So the spirit of what I prove is here, right? There's a chirp, there's an anti chirp, and uh, one is delayed. And, you know, we have the undergraduates, I, you know, and we have computer scientists and electrical engineers. I, I can't give the whole quantum theory. Yeah, I understand. We have people from Delta who are sitting in the front row but it, but it is, wanting to make quantum radar systems. It is. It is. This this one you need infinitely fast detectors. You need to be able to that's the, that's the France. And the other one actually requires integration time to be infinite. Well, and, and so now, if I recall, Franson also required to have a positive and negative that's right, yeah. material. So why just I where, just where, have where, where, where the where the Chow one is not? That's right. Yeah, you don't. Is, yeah. Which is why it's used in quantum so it, in my ancient brain, I muddled the two theories together, but you were the only one I noticed. So <laughs> I, 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 I would say have some coffee and wake up and drink the, you know, coffee. So. Well, I am. Um, so the kids now know Hebrew. Everybody knows Hebrew. Oh. Your wife. It's, it's been <laughs> more challenging for her. But. Yeah, yeah, they, but, yeah. But you, but you have to teach class in Hebrew, right? Uh, no, no. I, I try to do most of my conversations in Hebrew, but right now I'm severely jet lagged. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it's really hard for me to speak. Thank you for coming to my class. He's Mormon, so he can't drink coffee. The jet lag. I mean, the only thing that, the only way that I balance jet lag is that when I'm sleeping, I drink, take caffeine, and when I'm awake, I take alcohol. And you have, you have nothing. <laughs> Alright, I'm going to use the bathroom and I'm going to come back. Hey, so, um, I think I'm probably going to have to leave now. Okay. My, I, I do want to see what, or if we could talk about it. Yeah, guy is sort of running my schedule because I'm not, I, I'm not keeping track of it. So, there's, there is a dinner with the Elta guys. Okay, one night. I forget which night. And, and I'm assuming, since they're not currently in the room, I can invite you. <laughs> okay, so this will be some fancy dinner with the, 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 the quantum radar guys. So the dog cats will be there, and I, I can, we can probably sneak in there. And then there's another dinner, supposedly, with the students, but that has Lior, you know Lior? He was a guy's PhD student, now my postdoc. So he had all these plans, and we'd come back and arrange a student night, we'd all go out. And he, he's not been in for years, so all of his friends are taking him out every night. He's completely forgotten about me. So, so, and you know, I still have to prepare, I'm trying to minimize the number of additional activities that have to prepare notes and so forth. So, I'm, yeah, I, I am happy if you come to the Elta dinner. Because you know, I mean, you can blather on about weak measurements and all that crap. You know, they like they're, they're interested in quantum illumination too. So any crazy thing you want to throw into the, into the mix uh, would probably be appreciated. So you're um, you're um, uh, I like caves as paper. You do not improve your signal to noise by throwing away most of your data. And I understand what you're doing. I thought that I don't understand the physics. And, uh, 
Yeah, I know. 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 But it's. Uh, but you know, you remember Bob Soon Omar Magana? He's now an assistant professor in my department. So he's a weak measurement. So I have to, you know, I, 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 you know, it's just like living in Jerusalem. We have all these different religions, right? And you, you have to walk carefully and make sure that you don't insult the people in the We all are in this small plot of land that have to move peacefully together. You like the lectures? So they just have to figure out the Rosetta Stone showed what each character corresponds to which word. Word, yeah, it's in, it's in, yeah. Once you have a few, it's like cryptography. You figure out a few, and with some other information, you can get the, all the rest. This is used in the religious language. It's about third century. Yeah. The ancient Egyptian schools farther back. Farther back. So not like any language to develop. Right, right. It would be like me trying to understand the medieval English or, or Yeah, but you could figure it out if you were slowly. Okay, but what was the statement on the Rosetta Stone? Somebody won a battle. I want to say the colony, but that's that's too late. So, I think, I think it was the colony announced they won the battle against the somebody. The Philistines, I don't know. But that was the announcement, and he was very happy he won the battle. He was free. I was Googling this, you know, and I thought it was But what was written on the Rosetta Stone? The colony has won a great battle in the period of the war. The great thing that Napoleon did was he brought Fourier to Yeah, 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 yeah. Fourier was like this uh, chief scientist and, and they looted all of these treasures and hauled them back to France. One of them was the Rosetta Stone. Speaking of that, Fourier also was designing bridges and stuff in Napoleon's army and uh, he was very engineering. I just checked with the Rosetta Stone. Apparently, it said that some of the churches support the king. Not everything I read on the internet. But you read it on the internet. I read it on the internet. Yeah, so. Don't give it back, back to Bruce. <laughs> So here's the only four, only two times faster. You have four here, but you have two here. You, you, you know, I maybe it, this is just the two. This is the early one. The four came later. Yes, it should be two. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. So the confession is, I went to Haggai Eisenberg's house for Shabbat lunch yesterday. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I thought, why is he inviting me? It was very nice. And so the reason he invites me, he has a whole selection of Irish and Scotch whiskeys. 
<laughs> so normally he has one or two on Shabbat, but his wife cuts them off. But if he has a distinguished visiting professor, then we can go through the entire collection of the case test. Okay? So after Shabbat, then I went back to the hotel bar and had a bottle of wine and prepared my notes. Okay. So there's a few, a few more typos today than normal. Okay. Okay. So I saw that as your equations go along, the whole the letter is going to the ground state. I, 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 and the end went to the ground state. I, I, you know, it's like, it, it looked fine last night, but <laughs> as I said, I was, uh, there's an old quote from the famous writer Ernest Hemingway, you should write drunk but edit sober. But in my case, I was writing sober and editing drunk. So <laughs> in the reverse order, it doesn't work. So Brom Burton. Your students want to talk to me. When, when are we moving? A guy, a guy, one, two, three. Tomorrow? Okay. I, tonight I'm not going and I'm going to work on my slides for the And Tuesday I have to meet with Nadav in the morning and the Tuesday. And then we'll talk at Tuesday. Tomorrow? Yeah, we'll show you. No, no, no. I usually prepare the talk at night and I'm done. Is the middle of the bar? Three is too late. He had to leave. He's, he's very generous. Someone pointed out this. So I, I have to, I, I will tell the confession. I have several confessions. Of this. And normally I prepare the talks in the evening the night before because if I prepare them the day before, I forget what I'm talking about. So Professor Eisenberg politely invited me over to his house for Shabbat lunch. And we said prayers and it was very nice. And I'm wondering why he's inviting me. And then I realized, well, on Shabbat, he has a collection of these fine whiskeys, okay? Irish and Scotch whiskeys. But his wife, Helen, usually cuts them off at two. But if he has this, two drinks, okay? But if he has a distinguished visiting professor, then we can have a whiskey tasting that goes on for hours, okay? And so this is what we did. And, and then I went from the house at sundown, back to the hotel, to the bar, got a bottle of wine, and prepared the slides. So, if there are a few confessions, okay, so this is a two before experiment came along later. So this is the simple one where they do the control not they gate and they get a factor of two. You can count. One, two, one, two, three. Oh, now. Two and four. No, no, yeah, it's actually, you know, you, 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 you scare me. This is, this is the typo. It's, they didn't plot the ones, because right. this is two, two and, and this is four. So this is, okay, so the, I'm focused on this one, not one. But remember, we already said one equal to two, so it's, it's correct. <laughs> All right. Okay, so now I spent a week talking about Magzender interferometers. And then I spent an hour talking about the Thomas clock Ramsey interferometers. Now we're going to talk about the ramsey Magzender interferometer, which is one thing. Okay. So... Important thing here to realize the chalks keep migrating over here where they are not really useful. It's the season. Ah. Guy with long hair. Yes. Turn the light on. What's your name? Shaka. <laughs> you look at yeah, 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 yeah. The guy with long hair. Okay. okay. Where's the eraser? Ah, also over here. Yeah. Okay. So, when we're talking about the Ramsey atomic clock, 
The pi pulses are, are radio waves, okay? So they're, this is what we call semi-classical approximation. We treat the atom quantum mechanically, but the light is treated classically. But now we're going to go to optical Ramsey interferometers, where we have to treat the light field quantum mechanically and the atoms quantum mechanically. So who's my Sani? Shani? Yes. Yeah? She's staring at the remains of her dinner, wondering. <laughs> okay. So what is the energy of a photon? in terms of frequency omega? Yeah. P times C. Or, uh, Say it louder, I just can't hear you. It's P times C. No, it's, uh, okay, but in, uh, in terms of, ah, okay. Too, too much relativity, not enough quantum optics. <laughs> Einstein's most famous equation. Planck's most famous equation. No, the first person to write this down was Einstein. For the photon. Planck, remember, Planck was talking about the oscillators in the wall. So this is the first time somebody says the energy of a photon is h bar omega. This is the photoelectric effect. So remember the photoelectric effect. They shine light onto a plate and electrons come out. You don't get more electrons by cranking up the intensity. You get more electrons by cranking up the frequency. And that was Einstein won the Nobel Prize for that. Not for relativity. That was too crazy, okay. And uh, in Browning in motion, that was... I don't know, but anyway, photoelectric effect. Uh, so the momentum is equal to k uh, times h bar. Now k for a photon in free space is equal to 2 pi over lambda. So this is the de Broglie wavelength relation for a photon without mass, OK? So we know that the momentum is related to the wavelength, but photons don't have any mass. So you have a special formula for the photons, okay? And uh, actually, the Brolé was staring at these equations, and then he said there must be a similar equation for matter, and then he cooked up a similar equation, wrote down wavelength for, for electrons, and they were not going to give him a Nobel Prize, and then find, but suddenly somebody did an experiment, the Stur not the Stringer, like the uh, uh, Germer, Davidson Germer experiment, first experiment that. They diffracted electrons off of a, a lattice of a crystal and no. saw all the wavelength. No, no, no. Oh, no. Davidson Germer. Yeah, I think that's right. See, I didn't even look at Google. I just noticed. The wonderful thing about Shabbat dinner is when I'm arguing with his son about some trivia, none of us can check our phone. So that, because <laughs> now I've reached the stage of my life when I say nonsense, everybody checks the phone and says I'm wrong. But during Shabbat, they have to believe me because I'm the loudest one in the room and no one can touch the phones. It's, I, I have one day where I'm the smartest person in the room. Okay. okay, so what this means then is if I have an atom in the ground state, okay, and it gets, I'm going to put the photon coming this way. This is one photon. This is per photon, right? Okay? It has a momentum. So imagine the atom is going this way, and the photon is going this way. So this is the decay vector. This is the velocity of the atom. And now it depends on, same as Ramsey, is it a pi pulse, a pi over 2 pulse, or, or a what? Okay. So if it's a pi pulse, the atom in the ground state becomes an atom in the excited state. Okay? Pi over 2 poles puts it in the middle. It's a superposition. Pi poles takes you from ground to excited, or if you're in excited, takes you from excited to ground. A 2 pi poles just takes you back to where you start. Okay? That's, so this is, imagine my block sphere, right? No poles, pi poles, uh, pi over 2 poles, pi poles, 2 pi poles. Okay? So, I'm first, if I give it a full uh, 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 photon, it gets a kick, okay? And it goes up because it now has a momentum. Momentum here is zero. It absorbed the photon, momentum is conserved, okay? So it now has a momentum of what the photon had, h bar k. So it gets a kick, it goes up, okay? If I don't do anything, it goes in a straight line. Okay, so pi pulse up, okay, nothing, or two pi pulse down, 
and doesn't do anything. All right, perfect. Now here's the quantum magic. If I apply a pi over two pulse, it is in a superposition of getting the kick and not getting the kick at the same time, like Schrodinger's cat. So it's not either here or here, but it's in a superposition of both places. So I have now made a Mach Zender interferometer with pi pulses because I now have an atom moving this way. And there's my pi, this is the pi over two pulse here, okay? And, uh, but, and then I have the atom moving this way, but it's one atom, okay? In a superposition of the two paths. So now that we know our pulses, I apply the pi over two pulse here. Well, pi over two is a superposition of zero and pi, so either nothing happens, it keeps going, or it gets a kick and goes up, just as I drew. Now here, I apply a pi pulse. Pi pulse, if it's up, it goes down. If it's down, it goes up, okay? So <coughs> when I apply the pi pulse, this guy, uh, 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 well, I'm not going to go through the, the it emits, a, it, when I apply the pi pulse, uh, okay. if I apply the pi pulse, if it's up, it goes down. So if it's in this guy, it goes down and emits a photon, right? Because energy is conserved. In the same direction. With the in the same direction, and it gets a kick, which changes its direct, uh, direction, okay? And if it's down, and I apply the pi pulse, it absorbs a photon, okay? And it gets a kick this way. So these are my mirrors in the Mach-Zender interferometer, okay? This is the beam splitter, pi over two, which we know in Ramsey, the Rosetta Stone is the same as a beam splitter. Now I've introduced mirrors, okay, which are the pi pulses. And then I apply another pi over two pulse, which is the second beam splitter. And then I measure which ones are here and which ones are here, and I have the Ramsey interference ranges. What's new is when I told you about the clocks before, the atoms just moved along in a straight line because there was no noticeable kick. But now we have a kick. So there's actually a physical separation between the two arms of the interferometer. So now I can measure a phase shift, a rotation, gyroscope, uh, between these two arms. Or even better, I can measure the gravitational field. So the, this is so precise because I can lock this to an atomic clock, because essentially it is an atomic clock that I can measure the gravitational field potential difference between an atom here and another atom here, and this is what, millimeters? Probably millimeter separation, maybe microns. But I can measure that uh, MGH, mass times the gravitational field times the height. And the height is the distance between these two arms, okay? Now, you would get better signal if H was bigger, okay? But I know the atom mass extremely precisely, okay? And I know H extremely precisely, and I have a quantum atomic clock system that measures to within one part in a billion. Okay? So I can measure G extremely precisely. And that's what I want the measurement of the gravitational field. So I've turned my, now let's think of it like this. I have my qubit in the ground state. Curse the computer scientist, okay, moves up. I apply the pi over two pulse, and it now oscillates around in the equator. But the phase that I'm accumulating is not the time phase, it's the phase difference between the two arms, and the phase is proportional to MGH, which gives me the gravitational field. So now I have a device that's oh, compact, you can make this, that measures the gravitational field to one part in, in a billion. Okay? The, there is a relativity in this, right? There is something to do with time diffusion. It's not, that, just, it's, yeah, no, that, it ju it's not just the path length. I can make this course as complicated as you want. We can even include yeah, no, general no, relativity. No, but, but you should just know about it, uh, not to calculate. There are many things that they should know about that I'm not going to talk about. So if we went through all of the whiskeys except one, and he shows me this one whiskey. He says, it's very, it must be good. I bought it at the airport. Okay. It was the most expensive one. And it says Wayne Gretzky whiskey. Now, who is Wayne Gretzky? Anybody know who is Wayne Gretzky? Hockey player. Oh, famous hockey player. And I said, you paid double for this guy's name. That, that this is exactly he what he said, you. you paid double for I this guy's name. So then he brought it to the office because he only will share the crappy stuff with the students in the office. 
But he thought it was really good stuff, and then I had to explain Wayne Gretzky, you're paying double. Okay, yeah, you could include, you could measure relativistic effects using this, okay? But I'm, I'm kind of, I'm gonna look at more practical things. So I can measure the gravitational field. So measuring the gravitational field, you know, you do this in physics 101 lab, you drop things, or you have a pendulum. There are 28 different ways to measure the gravitational field. And you might get it to within 10%. Here I get it one part in a billion, okay, using this system. And this is how it works in real life. You, 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 uh, let's see. Let me see if I get this right. You launch the thing up. There's the pi over, first pi over two poles. And then it goes all the way up here. And then it comes back down again. I get confused which is which. But you want to throw it in free flight uh, so that it's in free fall. One way to measure the gravitational field is drop a ball and measure how fast it hits the ground. Okay, so this is the analog of... I was going to say Newton throwing the balls off the tower, but it was Galileo throwing the balls off the tower. Okay, so it's in free fall. So these towers, you know, it turns out the accuracy is uh, uh, related to the height uh, or the time of flight. So I throw it up. I want to throw up something that's not. Chalk, going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to throw up the chalk because it'll break. So in the lab, that's superposition. This thing is usually about a meter tall. What, one second. But remember, this is clock accuracy to a billionth of a second. That's a lot of, that's billions and billions of the oscillations of the clock transition. So you throw it up and it comes back down. One of these is the pi pulse, pi over two pulse, and the other one of these is the pi pulse, and then it, it's, it's sort of, they wrap the unit ferometer back around. But you can see they expand it here and then it's exactly the diagram. According to the graph on the right, the atoms are in free falling, and you kick them from the bottom. You throw them from the bottom. No, it looks like they are free falling, look, because it, with time. Yeah, no, no, down. no, the, 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 these arrows are the laser beams. So yes, two, two the laser beams. beams. Yeah. You, you're kicking from the bottom, right, right. but the atoms fall. Exactly, yeah, so these are not the direction of the atoms, these are the direction of the laser beams that are confining the atoms or applying the pi over two pulses. I, I forget the details. You, you, you will explain all the details uh, at, the, at the break. But the bottom line is that I measure the gravitational field with extreme accuracy, okay? And the accuracy you can show goes like, so there's your first pi over two, your pi, and your second pi over two. And t was what I just showed you, about one second, okay? So your accuracy, the, the signal actually goes like t squared. So you get an improvement in measuring the gravitational field. If I, if I throw a ball into the air and then let it drop, the accuracy goes like t. But with this guy, you get a t squared. Okay, so now I'm going to, this is quantum metrology, but I'm going to give applications. Okay. Can, can I ask a question? Sure. Let me try to the, stop The previous you. slide. The previous slide. So, so this is just a way to measure gravitational field, but it, it's not quantum apart from superposition. But how do you put some quantum metrology in this, into this idea and, in, and improve further the accuracy? So this is pretty quantum. Cool, huh? I have to treat the field quantum mechanics. Uh, this is superposition. So, so they have not done this yet, okay? But one of the things that Mark Kasovich and these guys want to do is make noon states, oh, GHZ that's states. That's question. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but this is, turns out to be very, very hard because they're not ions in a trap where I can apply control not gates or it's a cloud of atoms, okay? So they, there are some methods that we think we might be able to make these. One of the ones they looked at, remember my old scheme where I had the two BECs and I make a measurement and one, fo one particle is missing and I get an entangled state. So John Seip at Toronto analyzed that. So they're, but getting it to work is very hard. You, ne you never end up with a superposition of all spin up plus all spin down. You get a mixture, they're either up or they're either down. And when they're neither up, halfway up, they're neither up nor down. This is a song which we were singing at Shabbat for reasons I do not know. And the grand old Duke of York, he had 10,000 men. He marched them up the hill, and then he marched them down. After the Battle of Wine, and six out and, of and the And when eight, you're up, you're up. And reason. when you're down, you're down. And we're singing this, and his wife is like looking at her watch. Okay? <laughs> so anyway, you get these oscillations. Okay, And so it's pretty quantum. Adding entanglement would make this better, and people are looking at that. So far, they've not gotten to work. But I define, okay, so there was a paper, who has heard of the second quantum revolution? Anybody? Yeah. 
Who came up with that term? Exactly. <laughs> so, I, quantum technology, the second quantum revolution, I am the first author on that paper, 2003. So I get to define what a quantum technology is, okay? So, there are at least two ingredients. There must be uh, quantum uncertainty. When you measure measurement here it randomly, it collapses to up or down. And you must have some sort of quantum superposition. Okay, those are the two ingredients. So but no entanglement. You can have quantum technology without entanglement. So I'll give you an example. I'm going to speak foreign language for a second. In the BD84 cryptography protocol, no I send photons that are in the superposition, but there's no entanglement. But you cannot explain it without entanglement. You cannot prove. You cannot prove it without entanglement. But in the actual implementation, there's no entanglement. But everyone on Earth agrees BD84 is a quantum technology. Mm -hmm. It only has the first two of Dowling's ingredients. Okay. So some people require it must include entanglement, but since it's, I trademark the term in a second quantum revolution, I get to define what it means. Okay. So blah, 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 how do we make this? So I'll give you an example. So one of the things people are worried about, and I mentioned this before, if the GPS goes down or is jammed, the I could go, what is the Israeli analog of Radio Shack? There's no place I can go and buy it. No. 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 AliExpress. No. Ali, I can go on AliExpress. Yeah. And for a hundred dollars, I can buy some. Okay, this is down to the schedule. Okay. I, I go on AliExpress. And for a hundred dollars, I can buy, make a circuit board with stuff I buy that jams the GPS signal. It emits a broadband radio wave. And it may be over a 10 kilometer radius. So anybody in that radius. Yes has no GPS. Imagine if I stuck this in the middle of Jerusalem, that the traffic is already bad. Imagine nobody can access ways in a, anywhere near Jerusalem. Okay, Probably so the traffic will be better. And then, you know, people are worried about uh, the Chinese. Is it against the law? Yes. Oh. What depends on the country and depends on the law. In the U.S., it's against the law. But we're talking about a scenario where it's wartime and people want to kill your GPS. Okay, and there was... And you. The Russians are already using that. Well, so are the Americans and so are the Israelis. So, you know, so the... Uh, the Bangorian airport had to move a few of the landing trucks because of Russian activity in, in, no, the, no, no, no. in the Mediterranean. No, no, no. I mean, that's the southern border, right? No. The northern border. There's one at the southern border, too, where there, there's jamming signals leaking over into Israel, and they have tall tones. Okay. And the other thing is, Chinese, 10 years ago, there was a Chinese communication satellite that was no longer working. So the Chinese had a killer satellite that they rammed into the satellite to show that they could destroy satellites in space uh, with kinetic energy weapons. So the other possibility is somebody takes out the satellites. Then, then it doesn't matter where your jammer is. You're you 2,000 pieces of metal flying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would everybody complain. Okay. So there's many reasons why you would like to navigate without GPS. We've become addicted to GPS. And in some sort of bad scenario, if GPS goes down, we're going to be in trouble. So there's one platform which can never use GPS. It's a submarine because the GPS signals do not penetrate water. Okay. So the submarines, they would like to do this. They come up, get their <coughs> GPS location, precise time, then they go down and navigate for a year under the water, and then they come back up and, and they want to be no more than a meter away from where they went down without GPS. How do you do that? Okay, so it turns out if you have accelerometers, so a gravity, we know from Einstein, back to relativity. Einstein's equivalence principle says acceleration from gravity and acceleration from a moving platform are they identical, okay? So if I have a gravity, a quantum gravity measuring machine, I have a quantum accelerometer with a precision of one part in billions, okay? So this is what it looks like uh, with uh, currently. These are classical accelerometers, okay? And I need to measure the acceleration this way, that way, and that way with very high accuracy, okay? The other thing that I would like to do is measure the rotation with very high accuracy. The rotation around that axis, the rotation around that axis, the rotation around that axis. So with those three measurements, then you can write down the position of the submarine in terms of the vector as a function of time. 
And if you know your initial position, ah, let me go forward, where's my equation? Ah, okay, I just, too many forward, huh? Okay, I'll just state it, it'll come later. If I know, so you can show that if I have a vector r of t, the position of the submarine, if I know my initial position and my initial time, it also helps to have very accurate clocks, then I can go down and then everything else about the trajectory is determined by the accelerations and the gyroscopes. Okay. And having a good atomic clock helps as well. Okay. So the idea then would be to replace these guys with the atomic versions, which are much more precise. Now, I didn't mention how you make a gyroscope with the atom interferometer, but just like we saw with the Mach Zender, remember the quantum gyroscope, which was last week? If I rotate the Mach Zender, I get a gyroscope effect. So the Mach Zender that measures gravity, I can put it, instead of putting it this way, measuring gravity, I can put it this way and rotate it, and it measures rotation rate. So I can make all six of these things out of these little uh, 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 precise uh, atomic atom interferometers. And there's, and now, is that enough? Well, if you're, for many applications in airplanes and so forth, this is enough, but not necessarily for submarines, okay? So we need one more thing. This is for Shani. Sani or Shani? Shani. Shani, okay. So you've seen this? This is Einstein's equivalence principle? They didn't get to this in relative? Ah, okay. So, if you're in a rocket ship that's accelerating at 1G, if you do drop a ball, it'll fall to the ground, you know, at the 1G uh, meters per second squared. If I do the same experiment on the ground, where the acceleration is 1G, I do the experiment, I get the identical result. So Einstein's equivalence principle says it is impossible to distinguish between an experiment and an accelerating ship and an experiment sitting on the ground in 1G gravity. So that means locally I cannot distinguish between gravity and acceleration. Okay. Even the path of light will be... Light will be bended also. Yeah, light will... I'm not going to go there, but okay. But you have to believe... So this is a problem, for example, if I am a submarine and I am navigating through this, okay? Because I have my accelerometer that's measuring the acceleration of the submarine to give me my accurate information. However, since acceleration is indistinguishable from gravity, if I'm navigating next to these things and I don't know exactly their gravitational mass structure, the accelerometer will have a, a, an error due to the gravitational force of the nearby mountains. So you don't worry about this in space and not so much in the air, but in submarines, this is probably where you want to be navigating to stay hidden, okay? And then you're in trouble. There's an American attack submarine where they couldn't distinguish between the acceleration and the gravity, and they thought they were going one way, and they went the other way, and they hit the mountain, underwater mountain sink. Yeah, not good, okay? So you would like to be able to distinguish between gravity and acceleration. You cannot do this with a local measurement, Einstein tells us this, but you can do it with a non-local measurement. So this is the gravity gradiometer. I take two gravity measuring devices. So here's an example, a mass on the spring. I know the mass, I know the spring constant. I measure how much it stretches, I get gravity out of that, okay? That's acceleration. But if I take two of these guys, and I know the distance, and I can use the two signals to construct the gravity gradient. And the gravity gradient, because this is non-local, allows you to distinguish between gravitational acceleration and platform acceleration. This is the key point. And also this type of uh, uh, gravity gradiometer, as I mentioned before, this allows you very accurately to look for underground tunnels and things like this. Uh, but that's another story. I'm going to stick to the navigation. So what do we do? We take two of our Ramsey Mogzender atomic interferometers, one here and one here, and we phase lock them with the single laser beam. And I measure uh, acceleration here, and I measure acceleration here. And let's, uh, next equation, here. And what I'm doing is taking the derivative of the gravitational acceleration, okay? GXX is the G derivative in the X direction. And I make a tensor, okay? This is the Hessian matrix. And this is related to the gravitational potential 
okay? And out of this, I can back out the gravity versus from mass acceleration from the platform acceleration, and then my submarine doesn't run into an underwater mountain, okay? So for submarine navigation and for looking for underground tunnels, you want to measure this. And you can do this with two of the accelerometers locked together with a precision of one part in a billion, just as good as the regular guy. I mean, here you see this is the gravity gradient fringe shift. And uh, people uh, do these. I know uh, Ben Gurion is working on this. Mark Kasovich at Stanford has been doing this. And so the underground tunnel detection is Mark Kasovich uh, uh, built one of these things at Stanford. And uh, they had funding from a US three letter agency and uh, to build this and they drove it around on NASA. This is how I know about it because they, they were looking for a place to test this. And I said, well, the NASA lab, NASA Ames, okay, it's an old Navy base that was converted to NASA and has all these underground steam pipes and places, you know, construction and buried pieces of buildings. So, I did, so drive it around there and look, look for the uh, underground tunnels and see if you could find them. So, but then there was a big discussion because the three-letter agency, it's not NRO, it's not NSA, another one, and they said, well, they don't want it to be in a, you know, an insecure place, so it has to be like in a NASA place. They can't have it at Stanford because it's now a top-secret tunnel-finding machine. So they, they couldn't keep it, the truck. It's on a truck, but they were not allowed to keep it at Stanford because of, it was not top-secret enough. So they kept it in a, a giant balloon hangar on the Navy base inside of the NASA base at, uh, at NASA Ames. So this is by uh, San, San Francisco. And, and, and I remember I was helping with Mark Kasovich negotiate this deal, and I was beer drinking buddies with the director of the NASA Ames lab, and so I got him involved. And so many, many months of discussions and negotiations, we finally got the truck with the gravity gradiometer into this dirigible hangar and you know all ready to go and they did a few trial runs but this is my favorite part so and uh, the thing is running and it takes a lot of power it has batteries and the lasers are very powerful so there's one graduate student watching the thing in the hangar and he gets a phone call from his girlfriend and walks out of the hangar to get better reception and the entire truck catches on fire and burns completely to the ground okay <laughs> one billion dollars worth of so after all of these discussions, okay, so Mark calls me with this news, and I could not stop laughing. I just was, I, I, because of all of these discussions and everything, you know, and then it burns, so he goes, this isn't funny, John, this is not funny, and I, and I just, I just, and every time this comes up, I start laughing again, so. <laughs> Government bureaucracy at its best. But now he has a company that makes these things, and he will sell them to you. Okay, but the gravity gradient gives you the gravity signal separate from the acceleration. And so if this is how the tunnel detection would work. You measure the gravity gradient in, uh, in direct directions. This is the signal from one of the uh, tensors, uh, elements in the tensor. This is the signal from the element, other element in the tensor. And this is the signal from another element. The different curves means tunnel is there or tunnel is not there. You do machine learning on this. And uh, it's hard to see a tunnel that is already there because there's a lot of clutter and so forth. But it's easy if you drive your truck along the same fence every day. If a tunnel is not there yesterday and it is there today and you difference the signals, you can see that. How many detectors do you need there? Like 18 if I count? The more, the more the merrier, right? The the, yeah, I mean, you, in, in, in principle, you need one nine, okay? And you get nine different looking signals and then the idea is we had something where we would take all of the signals, put it on a computer, we called it hyperspectral gravity imaging where you would add the different gradients and different colors and then you would stare at it and go, ah, oh, there's a tunnel. So wouldn't it be really hard to, to, to map and then reproduce the same measurement? Because you're on a truck with this very sensitive device. Every time you pass by, you're, you're going to compress the ground a little differently. You're going to have vibrations. And well, okay, so, so compressing the ground, I mean, this is Israel, the, the ground is not that compressible, okay? The wonderful thing, another wonderful thing about this uh, gradient is if I'm measuring the acceleration, the gravitational acceleration directly from a moving platform, like a truck or an airplane or a drone or whatever, 
the acceleration of the platform, because of Einstein equivalence principle, is confused with the acceleration of the gravity, and you get a lot of noise. But the whole point of this guy, and measuring acceleration here and acceleration here, and taking the, the, the gradient. So, if yes, common mode rejection. This is all on one truck. So the things are oscillating up and down. So any acceleration that's common to both of these guys, like vibrations from the truck, is canceled out in the gradient. But what about the change in your height? Well, you, you, this thing is only about this, this tall, right? So you lock it down in the truck, it's at a pipe. Okay, so the, the height is not changing. I mean, if these two guys change together, which is what vibrations and stuff will do, it doesn't matter, as long as the distance remains the same. So you, you can do, I'll send you some papers, recently declassified, uh, where you can actually show the, the common mode rejection. So this is wonderful for a moving platform because A, acceleration of the platform completely, you only get gravity from mass. That's a critical point. Good question. Okay, so uh, we're coming to the bitter end, okay. So let me talk about, so now we have this Ramsey thing, okay, it measures time, it measures gravitational field. Any sort of phase that you would put in here, uh, any sort of, uh, is going to be measured with high accuracy. So again, this is the Ramsey configuration. So when you actually look at the cesium atom, the cesium transitions, the upper and lower state, are hyperfine transitions, microwave hyperfine transitions in the cesium atom, which is a hyperfine transition is very sensitive to magnetic fields, okay? So often when they build the clocks, they build the whole thing using transitions that are not sensitive to magnetic fields because they want time. But you can easily pick a new atom where the time is not the relevant metric and the magnetic field is the thing that you want. And then that Ramsey fringes now instead of giving you timing information are giving you magnetic field information. And again, there are some ideas to entangle these, but I'm going to show you a, a slightly different route. And we sent a little bit right? NV center. If you would wait, Professor Eisenberg, I will show a picture of an NV center. Okay. Uh, so, but the idea is that you have, for example, the nuclear spin in the atom, you apply a magnetic field, there's some precession. Precession rate is proportional to the B field. You put this into a Ramsey interferometer and you measure the magnetic field very precisely. And this is, you know, measuring magnetic field is. Even the gravity measuring machine, that one of the commercial applications is you take the gravity radiometer, which you can make into like a long tube because it's very tall, and you lower it down an oil well, okay? Because there might be some oil you missed. And so you lower it down the oil well, and oil is much less dense than dirt, okay? So as you go down, you look for oscillations in the gravitational field, and, it, and you can show that with some math, you can invert the signal and find miss oil pockets that you missed and then send another tube down, okay? Because if, if you drill, it's very expensive if you don't hit anything, but if you know where the oil is, then your profit goes up. So John Clauser actually holds all the patents on atom interferometry for oil well and, uh, and size devices, okay? So magnetic fields, a magnetic field of the Earth, magnetic fields that come from just before earthquakes, Military applications or underground munition dumps are often magnetic. And my, my favorite application is if you want to detect a submarine, magnetic field is the best way to go because water is not magnetic, okay? But the submarine sitting in the Earth's magnetic field becomes spontaneously magnetized and becomes a gigantic magnetic dipole, okay? So the idea is you have a, a magnetometer and you drag this through the water behind your ship or maybe put it in a drone or low-flying aircraft and look for a large dipole. Water should not have a large magnetic dipole, and you have a submarine tracker. Okay, and so as Professor Eisenberg, using his psychic abilities, said one of the best uh, two-level systems for doing this is an NV diamond uh, 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 material. <coughs> the, te the chemistry is that diamond is made out of carbons. You remove one of the carbons and you put in the nitrogen, and then there's like a, a, an, ex, an electron missing, which is the vacancy. I don't care about that because this is not the chemistry department. But you get this very nice uh, multi-level system. So here you can see this is proportional to B, the magnetic field. So these hyperfine levels twist around. But this is, you can use this as sort of a stationary Ramsey. And the moving Ramsey, I threw the atoms and then I applied the pulses. But there's no reason I have to throw them. I keep them in one place and apply the pulses in time, still the same thing. 
So here you get very accurate, and this is, this is actually the Weizmann Institute, Professor Finkler's uh, scheme, and many people are self-making companies now using these as magnetic field sensors. One of the goals is medical. You could, you know, you take somebody and put them in an MRI machine. What is Hebrew for MRI? MRI. MRI. Okay, great. And again, you put them in an MRI machine, and you can get an image of you know, like the entire um, body, but not a very good re resolution. And if the guy or is too big and doesn't fit, or has a metal knee, right, you can't go in the MRI machine. So the goal is to make it, these things work at room temperature. At least this is the promise. There is a company like that that was established at the Hebrew University by Alex Fletcher. Great. Called Envision. So you can buy those. So they work okay. at room temperature. And because it's diamond, you can access these levels using optics. You can send the pulses in optically and bring them up. Yeah, you can, you can read and uh, your Ramsey pulses are you all that optic. optics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, it's, it's, uh, because it's diamond, it's transparent. And uh, you can read and write these things all optically and extract the information. So the one idea is to make a hat with the envy diamonds all over the hat, okay, measuring the magnetic field of the neurons in the brain transmitting electrochemical signals. Okay, that's the accuracy that they're promising. But there, there's lots of applications where you would like to have up close, very, the problem with magnetic field, it's always a, a dipole. You don't have any magnetic monopoles. So the dipole falls off like one over r cubed. The monopole falls off like one over r squared. So you have to be really close to get a good magnetic reading. And so these things, you know, you know the, the enemy diamond is, is, it's not a girl's best friend. It's a tiny chip, okay? And we don't want to make a wedding ring out of that. But the, the point is you can make many, 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 many chips, many of these little diamonds on a single chip, and people are doing this, okay? There's, the end, and you can see there's a missing thing here, that's the vacancy. Okay, so now I'm going to end with one thing that I define to be quantum technology, and I get to define whatever I want. But I like this because what is the motto of the, of the, of the course? Quantum computing helps metrology and sensing. That's my, my theme, okay? John, it's about the time for a break, so how much do you still have? Uh, I actually am almost done. I don't know why, but the, nobody's going to... En not enough questions. Yeah, maybe not enough questions. So I, six bottle of liquor. <laughs> I have 60 slides, which is exactly how many slides I had last time. Oh, well, let's take a break. We'll see how... I don't know how many more slides I have. That's a good but this is a good point for a break. So this is slide... 51 out of 60, so I have 10 more slides. I think nobody, including the lecturer, will mind if we end early. A three-hour class is very long. Bromber, you're registered for the course. You can sort of. No, you're on my roster, so what grade do you like? Whatever you need to fix the average. Yeah, 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 yeah. If a guy wants to be dramatic, so C can work. If he gets a plus, huh? Ah, you register for credit. But I, I, I saw your name, I go, oh God, Lombard is going to be. Not quite. You, 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 you're, you're, you're not like the dog. And the dog is yeah. yeah. A guy thinks we're mad at each other, but we, we, the dog and I, this is how we have fun, going after each other. There's the same thing going on. Yeah. Yeah, so this is, this is part of the fun. All right, what's up? So tomorrow, actually for me, 2 p.m. will work better. Uh, 2 p.m. is optional because we go to lunch at 1, and at 2 p.m. I have coffee. So by two, by, so I'm drinking coffee and ready to do physics. Okay? And then at, at 3.30, we have to start packing up to come here. Okay. So I as a bird, 2 p.m. I meet with the Bromberg. Okay? I got Do you have my WhatsApp? No. So by you can do it by name. JP Dowling all together. Try that. 
I mean, I'm searched by name. If that doesn't work, I can, I can give you my number. I don't, they're not writing it on the board, then all the students will have one choice. Let me give you the number. Okay. So, this will be, so you plus sign, one, I'm waiting for Rondo to do so. Two, two, five. Two, eight. One, seven, eight. Yeah, so try now and I will. I have WhatsApp, I have WeChat, which is the Chinese. I never doesn't use WhatsApp, so I have, I have to use Signal, which is like the double security system. Yeah, so, so I plan to be sitting in the coffee room at 2 o'clock. If you show up and I'm not there... So you're at Mark's. Oh, where we have after the... No, we're talk I'm not trying to look at the lab anymore. No, no, no. Coffee is better than Mark's. Or wh where are you having coffee? I'm not... I'm, I'm going to have coffee in Mark's and you're coming there. Okay. I'm not going anywhere. I wanted to offer you a bit of coffee. Not fine, 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 fine. Fine. It's not his Mark's. coffee, it's... Cohen's coffee, so Cohen's coffee. Okay. Okay. Otherwise, you're going to take me to look at the lab again. Uh, uh, my, yeah, I said no lab tours, no more lectures, and no taxi rides across the street. Can you message me? If I message you, make sure you have You have to put the plus in front of the Otherwise, you won't know. Keeper! <laughs> report, block, add the context. You know, it's interesting that the choices are to report you or to block you. If it's sensitive enough, you can make one of these things could be a gravity wave. Hi, if you're wrong. Yeah, right. Report, then it's pornography block. Because I'm, they have me running around campus like racing over the world of places that guys are over there. So I'm racing in here and I'm racing it back. And I will have just come back from lunch at the biology room and I don't want to get to find your place. You know how to find me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They have my water. There was this big uh, battle between the University of Maryland and the Cassius Institute because the group of people in uh, Maryland were saying what Cassius is proposing for gravity waves is impossible and they were all saying it's, it's possible. I remember that the original proposal called for a 10 meter tall uh, it was a 10 meter tall atom capsule to get that sensitivity he was claiming. You have to be careful when, you know, so there's, there were people who thought LIGO would not, okay? Because they said, well, the gravity wave is stretching the metric of space-time. So it's not so simple to say that, you know, the arms are moving like this. You have to do a full general relativistic calculation. And then it turns out you can just pretend the arms are moving like this. But without, but, you know, there were people who argued that might look. So I think that's the problem. Gatsby says, well, you measure the time here and time there. But you, the, 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 probably the Maryland people, that's what the relativity group is. So, but this debate went back and forth for years with LIGO. They, some of them said LIGO would never say anything. Okay, so I, I'm staying out of this fight. And uh, there are other things I'm more interested in. We already have a machine that detects gravity waves quite well. And we're building more, so let's use that one.
I think Gasmich was claiming that his his atom fountain would be more sensitive at different frequencies. Well, that is a that's a big thing. The shorter the frequencies, you you know, LIGO is exactly designed to detect in-spiraling black holes and so on. But you know, there are some gravity waves left over from the Big Bang that are the size of the Earth, and so you need an antenna the size of the Earth to see them. As you know, your antenna should always be about the size of the wavelength of your oscillator. Right? So if your wavelength is several thousand kilometers and your antenna is one kilometer, it's not good. That's what I'm going to talk about on uh, Israeli Friday. How you link the sensors together, which is Thursday. I'm, all, I, I'm like the first email I sent to the group. I said, see you Monday, which I... It's Israeli Monday. About a year on the post office. I really understand. You knew it. The feeling you get... You it, but... The feeling you can get on Wednesday, yeah. 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 My solution is just to call Sunday, Monday. And then, you know, and then but this confuses everybody else, but I'm very happy. Uh, so I, this is, I don't know about the gravity waves, but I, I, I'm going to wait for the relativity people to settle down. You know, so it's interesting. Remember I gave you the gyroscope, right? And I said, you could just replace the mass of the atom with uh, h bar omega divided by c squared. And you get the right answer, but that's not the correct calculation. Because with the atom, I said this, okay, the thing is rotating, so this part of the wave function takes longer than the other and this one takes shorter than the But photons move at the speed of light in any reference frame. So it's nonsense to say this photon is moving faster and this one is moving slower because they all move at C. So if you do this analogous calculation and say they move at C, you get no effect. No optical gyro will work. Laser gyro will work. But what you have to do is you have to actually do a relativistic calculator. In a spinning platform, space time is slightly curved. And now you have to talk about the area enclosed in the curved space time with the metric. And then you get exactly the same answer as if you said the mass is equal to h bar omega. But, that, but you don't get the right answer by thinking so th there were people who said gyros, optical gyro, laser gyros will never work. Photon moves at sea. So you have to do the full relativistic calculation. So that's what's going on with gas. It's just like I don't think he's done the full relativistic calculation correctly. And, but every time the people argue that it'll never work, it turns out the full relativistic calculation gives you naively what you would expect. So I'm rooting for Gasovitz only because it's always what happens. They both know all of Raising and lowering metrics. LIGO was a big yeah, but the argument about whether it would work started in the 60s and went through the 70s. So, but you know, measuring gravitational fields, there's lots of other things to do with I don't want to compete with LIGO, and I think that's an issue there. You know, but I'd like to make a LIGO to diameter there. There are things of that way of like, and it's hard, it's hard to imagine many things that produce wavelengths on the order of meters of gravity waves on the order of meters. Astronomical objects usually be meters. Okay. So it would have to be the high frequency remnants of the cosmic background of gravity. Just like we have optical gravity radiation too from the Big Bang. Okay. But this is there's very little so they actually just do this. Dies off very fast. So it's a black body curve, gravity curve. Okay? And if you look at the black body curve, it's at low frequencies and high frequencies, it drops off you know, exponentially. And so the high frequency gravity waves are down in one of these tails. So it's hard to imagine. Again, Kasovich is a smart guy. Your name one more time? Simon. Like the lion from the, from the lion story. That was Simba. Simba. Okay, you're now Simba. Yeah. Yes, okay, the boss is calling you. See you tomorrow. Two o'clock. Thank you.
So for So in Catholic school, the nuns say they would have a bell. Ding, 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 ding. This is when you know you get the break is over. I have one of these bells. These are ordered online from Alibaba. And uh, so when it's time for the group meeting, every Wednesday we have a group meeting, the students are always late and they're in their cubicles working. And so I, I walk through the bell, ding, 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 ding. And one guy's like, I'm almost finished. And I, I go right up to his ear, go ding, 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 ding. And so they can't get any work done. And you'll shock it, electrical shockers. An electrical shocker, yeah. This is, even in Louisiana, this is not allowed. Okay. <laughs> so we were talking about the NV diamond. So you can think of the NV diamond as a qubit, after all the count. It's a qubit, and you put it into the, exactly they do the Ramsey sequence. It starts out in the ground state, which is up, okay. They put it in pi over two pulse, and then it goes around and around and around, picks up a phase, which is proportional to the gravitational field. Okay. So I'm going to give you another trick besides noon states, and then we will let Professor H. Eisenberg decide if it's uh, quantum or not. Okay. So in quantum uh, computing, we have error correction. The quantum computer makes mistakes, and you apply error correction. And so if you have error correction in a quantum computer from the Rosetta Stone, you should have error correction in a quantum sensor. You should be able to lift ideas from quantum computing and correct error. So one of the common, uh, so this is a paper. I love this guy because his first name and his last name are unpronounceable. You heard Okay. So I, I always tell the students, look up the paper by you heard And they students go, could you spell that? I don't know. <laughs> it's spelled just like it sounds. He's a fun guy. Okay, the idea is we're going to take an error correction protocol that was developed for quantum computing called dynamical decoupling, which actually has its origins in spins, and then it was lifted to control, uh, improve the fidelity of qubits in the quantum computer. So at a quantum computer, you have these qubits that are doing my calculations. And the qubits need to have a fidelity of like 99.99% in order to uh, reach the threshold where you can do universal quantum computing. So maybe your qubit is only 99%, okay? And then there's some intermediate tricks where you could uh, hit the qubit with pulses very rapidly and improve the fidelity to the 99.99% and then regular quantum error correction takes over. So this is the promise. So it's an idea that went from spins to quantum computing and back again. Okay, so let's see how this works. Okay, there's my qubit. You, you can see in the zero is up. There are different things that are down. Now, I'm unsure what, these are the different, uh, it's a three level structure in the NV diamond. So it, this, is, this is not supposed to make any sense. Uh, but it's supposed to, yeah, exactly, but it's supposed to impress you. So let's go to the next slide, which I think gives more sense. So, but the bottom line is that here is the fidelity of the qubit doing nothing. Bad. Okay, fidelity is one. You want it to stay one, 99.999%. But if you apply this wacky sequence of pulses, and the pulses are not the pi pulses or the pi over two pulses for the Ramsey. There are additional pulses that you apply very fast. So this is what uh, Gershon Karitsky would call the quantum Zeno effect to stop the thing from dephasing. Okay, but the bottom line is that this is what if you get not do nothing, the blue one is if you do these pulses. And the pulse sequences are being designed by the quantum computer people to make better quantum computers. You can lift exactly the same sequences and apply them to the magnetometer. That is the take home message. All right, so let's go back to the ancient days and this is, can it, nobody can see that probably. Long hair guy, would you hit the lights in? Thank you. 
not my name. I'm so, so imagine you have three people running a race. Sure. <laughs> okay? This one is medium, this one is fast, and this is slow. Okay? Single mode fiber. Single mode fiber. It could be a photon propagating in a single mode fiber, okay? So it's a lot like the group velocity. Remember the group velocity? Some guys are fast and some guys are slow. It's almost the exact same mathematics. So they're at the start line, and I shoot a gun, boom, and they run. Okay? So after a while, the fast guy is here, and the medium guy is in the middle, and the slow guy is back here. And in American English, guy can either mean girl or boy. So it's, it's very uh, generic. Okay. So this guy is ahead. Okay. But now, when they get halfway around the track, I fire the gun again and say, turn around and run back. Okay. So the fast guy is now going to catch up to the medium guy. The slow guy will slow down. And when they get back, they'll all be nicely collected together exactly when they started. So this is sometimes called the Han echo uh, effect because it's like an echo. They run out and then, then they come back and you see a signal from when they come back. Okay. So this is the first paper to see this. So they uh, all collect together. So this is, it's hard to see, this is my racetrack here. Okay. And there's the fast guy, the medium and the fast, medium and slow. And then you hit, and somehow flipping pancakes makes you understand everything. <coughs> But uh, yeah, and another way to look at this. So in the old days, maybe I should just stay up here. Ah, I think I know what I, I said. Okay, I don't have many slides, but since this is a course, I'm going to write on the board to suck up the extra half hour. <laughs> so remember the pulse, right? The pulse we had. And these guys went fast, and these guys went slow, and these guys went in the middle. Okay? You remember the pulse, the dispersion? Okay? Now, classically, you would say, well, there's some photons that are red that go fast, and some photons that are blue that go slow, and some are in the middle. But remember, we had the Simba. Simsa. Simsa? Simba's fine. Simba, okay. The Lion King, okay. <laughs> remember, this is a single photon, right? which is sometimes is ahead and sometimes is behind. It's in a superposition. Okay. So now let's look at our blocks here. All right. And so I'm not good at three-dimensional drawing, but I'll do my best. So I apply my, I have a different color. I apply my pi over two pulse. Okay. Kick it up and then it goes around and around the equator. And then I hit it again, and then I measure the time or the gravitational field or whatever. Now the point is, so let me now zoom down from the top. So this is North Pole, this is South Pole. So I'm now going to look from the top down from the North Pole. So this is my arrow. And you have to move to the rotating frame system. He's registered for the course. We'll all take a vote on Thursday <laughs> what grade he gets. Okay. So, so in this frame, it's rotating this way. I'm just making it easier to draw. Okay. So back in the time of Han and the Echo, they had many, 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 many nuclear spins. And so the picture was, some of them are going a little fast, like my runners, and some are going a little slow. Okay. And then as they run around the track, over here they spread out. Fast guy, slow guy, and medium guy, right? Okay. Then you hit it with the pi pulse. Now a pi pulse, anybody can solve this equation? Minus one. Pi pulse is equivalent to time reversal of the Hamiltonian. When you look at the Hamiltonian, it essentially gives you a minus one where you had a plus one before. So that's another way to see it. When I fire the gun, they run backwards. I'm reversing time. So the pi pulse is a time reversal. Can I, just, can I ask a conceptual question? Sure. Okay. I, do 
these techniques of NMR were invented to remove noise from measuring the inherent property of molecules or something like that. It seems like it should do the opposite of making a sensor better. So well, that, well, okay. that's why it's a surprise. Okay. For even Professor H. Eisenberg, in his class, if the students call him Heisenberg, he deducts points. Okay. So, yeah, so you would think that the blind pulses would screw things up. So, let, but we're going to get there. It makes it better. Okay. So, the idea is that, okay, in the old days, Han had 10 to the, with Avogadro, 10 to the 24 you know, nu uh, nuclei in his vat of goo. And he said, well, some are going fast, some are going medium, some are going slow. I apply the pi pulse just like the runners. I go back now. The fast guy is still going fast. This guy's, and then they recollect back here. Okay. The modern interpretation is I do this with a single qubit. <clears throat> just like my photon, I have one qubit, which is in the superposition of medium, fast, and slow. Okay? So when I talk about the phasing of a single qubit, you go, well, that doesn't make any sense. I don't have a slow guy in effect. He's in the superposition of slow, fast, and medium. So exactly the same thing happens. The arrow for one qubit begins to spread. It's a superposition of fast, slow, and medium. Which is bad because now if I'm trying to make a control not gate or Hadamard gate or something else, I want these to be collected together. And remember when we did the Ramsey fringes? I love, that's my favorite mathematical equation. E to the i pi equal minus one. So when we did the Ramsey fringes, remember they decayed? The primary reason they decay is because of this dephasing. The fast guys are running too fast, the slow guys are running too slow, and as, so each time, each, each of these are running at slightly different frequency, but it's only one qubit. But the superposition of the qubit is running fast and slow, and so as it dephases more and more, this goes down and your accuracy gets less and less, okay? So that's where the primary uh, uh, loss of uh, visibility in the fringes and loss of sensitivity in Ramsey comes from, it's from this dephasing. Remember, it's not a bunch of atoms running fast and slow. Some of them, it's one atom in a superposition of fast and slow, just like my pulse. Okay. So I whack it with a pi pulse, and then they all come back together again. Okay, and that's your Han echo, and it's back to where I start. Okay. So now the the point is that's not, as your intuition tells you, that's not good enough. Okay. That's not going to get you where you want to go. But the insight is there. So in quantum computing. You have qubits, right? And they are doing something, and in, in they're entangled with other qubits, and they're spinning around and so forth. But they also undergo dephasing, okay? Because the qubits are implemented in a superconductor or a spin <coughs> system or a spintronic system, some two-level system that is always dephasing. So what you would, inspired by this, you would say, okay, let's suppose much of the time when I'm doing a quantum computation, I have a whole bunch of qubits that are memory. They're just storing something for a certain amount of time, waiting for the other qubits to catch up, and then you take the data. So RAM, okay, like qubits are in RAM. So I'm not there, this is the simplest way to look at this. You can actually do this with gates and more complicated. But I have the memory, but the memory is dephasing, okay. So I would like to stop that, and I apply pulse sequences to stop that. But the simple pi pulse, which is intuitive, is not the best one. So what is the best one? Well, we don't know. It probably would take a quantum computer to figure this out, okay? So, ah, but this is exactly what I want. Here's the exponential decay of the envelope for the Ramsey fringes. Here you see the, the wiggles are getting, this is because the fast guy and the slow guy are, are adding incoherently, and if you add these all up, the incoherence between the different speeds give you the slower, this is the dephasing. That's just this picture projected into an, uh, from the phasor diagram into an oscillatory diagram. So you can see the different frequencies, they're spreading. There's more than three here, there's a whole bunch. But as they spread, the fringes go down, and that's bad. Okay. So you go to Han, well, he's dead. You prayed to Han, and the ghost of Han comes down and says, well, there's a pi pulse. Okay. But in quantum computer land, they say, well, pi pulses aren't good enough because these qubits are doing very cal ca elaborate calculations. And we do more than just put them in memory. We're doing operations of gates on them, so there are, uh, we want to protect them between the gates. We even want to protect them when they're in the gates, okay? So what we wanted to do is design a, 
yesterday. Designer pulse sequences that protect the qubit no matter what is going on, okay? Uh, I shouldn't be that body. Given the noise spectrum, find the optimal pulse sequences that protect the qubit the best. And it's not just one pi pulse, okay? So, but here's the pi pulse. This is just what I just drew. Okay, here's this guy. There's a spread. You apply the pi pulse and it comes back together again. So this is my, this is just my Ramsey interferometer here, okay? Freely evolution, okay. So now, the I, so I got ahead of myself. So this is just Ramsey, pi pulse, put it into the equator. It oscillates, but there's some dephasing, okay? You apply another pi pulse, this is Han Echo, and then it rephases, and then you knock it back up again. So this is the old fashioned way. So what you... In the combination between Ramsey and Michelson that measured the gravitation, we also had the pi pass in the middle. Yeah. Do, do you gain some uh, extra uh, nah. extra correction in, in that scheme because of, of I don't think pi? so. The pi pulse is just being a mirror. I know, I know, but th this is the original. Reason. That's a good question, but Professor Eisenberg. As you know, you're supposed to read one of the references and produce a one to two page. I don't report. need the credits anymore. Yeah, yeah. So, so you will report on this on on on, uh, on Israeli Friday. Okay. So I don't know. I, I doubt it, but I, if it helps, it's not much. Okay. If delta t one equal, equals delta t two, then there's no information here. So like. But delta t one is never equal to delta t two. If not, then you're still spreading. Yeah. yeah. It didn't cancel the spreading. Not not entirely, right? But. Yeah. Typically, they're not the same. But that's why we don't use this, okay? So now what we do is I get a, 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 my computer, or some, some people do this analytically by hand, and they say, what? Maybe I need more than one pi pulse. Maybe it's not even a pi pulse. What is the sequence of pulses that best protects against this dephasing, okay? And that depends on the structure of the noise. Gaussian noise, Markovian noise, probably these, this doesn't work at all. But if the noise has some structure, you look at the noise, the noise is basically, you know, you can think of dephasing as coupling to a bath, or there are other sorts of noise besides dephasing. And then you say, okay, how fast is it dephase? And then you cook up a model with pulses that protects best. Okay, what does best mean? Better than you, if it, if it better than anybody else has published, then you publish, and that is best, okay? Because there's no real uh, theory that says that for a given noise or a given type of dephasing, what is the best pulse sequence? So we just, uh, in our group, historically what we, okay, so let me give you an example. So instead of doing this, we do this, okay? So we apply, here are my Ramsey pulses, and in the middle, I apply, here's a whole bunch of pi pulses around the y-axis. This is a mixture, this is pi pulses around the x-axis, here we have, again, pi pulses around the y-axis with an extra guy on, on the bottom and the top. So this is a really old one, and what we do is we just try them on the computer and see which one works. We put in the, 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 the qubit, we put in a model of the noise, we let it dephase, and then we just say, which one works best? It's like uh, going to the Chinese restaurant and picking off of the menu, okay? So we, and we compare it to them to each other. So this C and P is the same C and P here, except M and G came in. So there's bazillions of these pulse sequences, okay? And they, they do differently for different types of noise. CPMG, when we do it the forward direction, seems to work best. I don't know why. And you take CP, add MG, it's much better, okay? UDD, I hate, okay? So this is, <laughs> so DD stands for dynamical decoupling. So applying pulses dynamically decouples your qubit from the noise or the debasing or whatever is going on. And so, you is a guy named Ulrich, Ulrich, also impronounceable. And so he came up with this scheme called, uh, 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 so this is unfair. In his own paper, he names the, the UDD after himself. You're supposed to wait for other people to name it after him. <laughs> and so he had this very nice mathematical expansion in terms of trig functions that showed that this was optimal for a particular kind of noise, okay? Uh, a particular kind of noise that nobody ever encounters in reality. So, so it was a very beautiful mathematical and description of a pulse sequence all in, you know, by hand. And, and so my favorite this story about UDD is that the ion trappers who make the good cloths 
said, so, well, we're going to demonstrate UDD. Okay. But the noise in the ion trap is not the noise that UDD corrects. So the ion trappers put noise into their beautiful clocks. It had exactly the spectrum that UDD corrects and then corrected it using UDD. Okay. So they added noise and then removed it. But it doesn't work for almost anything that you want to try. So one of the things that, so you know, you can see these are quite complicated and these are like delta function pulses. So the area under the pulse should be pi. So maybe we, you know, we make this not a delta function, but a step function. And you have to put, put constraints. The, the, the height of the pulse is the, the area of the pulse is the total energy. And your pulse generator, generator can't make a pulse with arbitrary height or arbitrary shapes. So you go, what can you make? You go, we can make a sine function, and we can make a, you know, some squares. And so then what we've been doing is we put them into the computer. We say, here's our noise spectrum, OK? And computer, start with CPMG, and then start, uh, and then add a little CP whenever you use UDD, and then begin using genetic algorithms and breeding these together, and find new pulse sequences that correct the, against the noise that we have. So this is something we're currently doing in quantum computer land to make the qubits from 99% to 99.99%, so we can make the quantum computer better. I'm funded by the army to do this. But you can apply this to the magnetometer. Okay. So this is the paper by Quattrock. Okay. And you can see they, they, they don't use, they use UDD and CPMG. You can see UDD is up is good. This is the fidelity. Okay. So UDD, as I mentioned, is always worse. And this is six pulses. Okay. And here they have a number, here's eight pulses, four pulses. So this is where, who, who here has not ever heard of the quantum Zeno effect? <laughs> Who has heard of the quantum Zeno effect? So the quantum Zeno effect says if I have a spin or some excited state like this, it starts to decay like this. If I make measurement, 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 measurement very quickly, it never decays. So it's, it's, it's the, it's the, uh, it's like with Zeno of, Zeno of, who's my history buff? Zeno of? The Greek. Yeah, but what part of Greek? Zeno. Uh, some town in Greece. Okay. Zeno, so this is the one you throw the arrow and the arrow cannot fly because in order to fly it must cover half of the distance and then the next I half of the distance it, and so it's frozen. Okay. So the quantum Zeno effect says if you make many, 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 many observations you're always collapsing it back into the original state. So you start getting quantum Zeno as the number of pulses increases because the pulses are acting as the, the measurements. So it gets better with more pulses. So you can see here's n equal 8, n equal 4, n equal 2, and no pulses, it decays rapidly. So this is the fidelity that you could extract from the fringes and the Ramsey. So we're taking ideas from quantum computing, make a better qubit. My qubit is no longer a quantum computing qubit, it's a magnetometer qubit. So these are, act, this is data, okay, in the Envy Diamond Center, and your ball trough. <laughs> And I just lifted some of these quantum computing pulse sequences, CPMG and UDD, and applied them, and then got this improvement. And so here it's not an issue of, okay, we're always talking about signal to noise. So I'm going to look at Professor H. Eisenberg, okay? So you decide if this is quantum enough. So when I talk about 1 over n versus 1 over square root of n, that's the noise, right? The minimum of detectable phase, okay? Here what I'm doing is I'm not changing the noise floor. But I'm improving the signal by making this last a long time instead of a short time. My signal goes up. Noise does not change. But signal to noise improves. So I'm not using entanglement to reduce the noise. I'm using quantum computing pulse sequence tricks to improve the signal. The signal all I care about at the end of the day is signal to noise. So I can make a better NV diamond magnetometer. And I don't really have to do anything except in the little hat put additional pulses. I have to put some pulses anywhere to do Ramsey. If I've got a good pulse generator and a good hat, I can do lots of these. Okay. So it's not so bad. I'm a half hour early. Uh, and this will be a little bit mathy. We'll see how much wine I have and we'll, we'll figure this out. But I thought one of the things that, uh, now let me give it an intro to this. Here I tell you I'm going to end early and then I just keep talking and talking. It's a, it seems so unfair. Ah! Okay. So I will.
This will save on time tomorrow. Oh. It's the Parkinson law. What? The Parkinson law. The Parkinson law. A job will take the time that you give, that you you give it. Uh, I thought Parkinson, I was supposed to shake or something. <coughs> so let's go back to our friend, the Monzender in a barometer, right? Mirror, mirror, beam splitter. Okay. And then we got this and this. And then we have the detectors. Well, remember, I redrew this, so all of this is in my source. I have my phase shifter. And then I have the detector. So in this, in this picture, the detector includes this, it includes that, it includes the beam splitter, and also this includes whatever entangled state I'm putting here, or if I'm going to put a noon state on this side, and we did this all last week, okay? So all of this is here. So now people say, well, what's the best, given a, a system like this, what is the best state to send through, okay? And, and then the other question you ask is, what is the best detection scheme? So people would play this game where they would fix the state and optimize the detection scheme, and they get a slightly better result published. Or they fix the detection scheme and fiddle with the states, which we were doing all last week, and you get a slightly better result, and you publish. Okay. So in quantum mechanics, you can write down a quantum theory of detectors. Okay. So this is something called POVMs, positive operator value measures. I'm going to talk a little bit about this tomorrow. But in, in, in the idea, the quantum theory of detectors is supposed to be so general it covers any kind of detector you might want to have. Holmendine, coincidence counting, photon number resolving, whatever you want. Okay. Well, you could write down uh, 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 essentially all detectors in terms of an orthonormal basis of every possible detection scheme using this, this mathematics. Seems improbable that you could do this, but it's wonderful. And then Independent of the detection scheme, you could optimize over all detection schemes. Over all. Quantum mechanics says anything that's a reasonable detector must fall into this set. I optimize over the set. And then I get a number, okay, uh, and the number sometimes is uh, 1 over square root of n, or sometimes it's 1 over n, but depending on what you're doing. But usually it's something along this line, okay. And it says, okay, independent, uh, you can fiddle with the states, okay, but you get an answer independent of the detection scheme, which is a relief. Now I don't have to optimize the source and the detector. I have a number that says no matter what detector you use, home and I, whatever, it's, it can't be better than this, and I just have to fiddle with one side, okay? So that's, that's uh, when we were talking about the quantum uh, radar and LIDAR. I remember I said, well, we have the noon states, the M and M states, and we have the coherent state, and we optimized. And so I didn't want to worry about what the detection scheme was, so I said we're going to use the thing that's called the quantum kramer rao bound, which is a bound on how good you can do. But it's, it, we were able to say, okay, no matter what the detection scheme, you can't do better than this. And so this is sort of liberating. I don't have to worry about half of the interferometer, not the other side. That's for tomorrow. That's for tomorrow. I'm just giving a, it's a little mathy, so, but, but well, like I said, we'll see how much wine I have in the bar. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, you're welcome. Why, why today do I get applause? I never got applause in my hand. You do get that. Do I? Finished earlier. I finished earlier. I, well, three hours is too long. I could die. <laughs> the last time I'm in an event that's three hours long is my PhD qualifying. <laughs> yes. Uh, I was wondering. There are some who uh, are French. Never met before. You were wondering what? Uh, there are some uh, who like very trendy in the past GAN. And others you know, using machine learning algorithms. In my mind, a genetic algorithm is just one kind of machine learning algorithm. So we're on this giant $1.25 million a year grant from the Army. <coughs> and it says, explicitly says, find out ways to optimize 
qubits for quantum computation using error correction. And then it, it says, step one, step two says, the winning proposal must use machine learning. <laughs> now, why the guy at the party yeah, became the obsessed with machine learning? Uh, because everyone else is like, yeah. <laughs> so, so, of course, we wrote a proposal saying we will use machine learning, and now we're using machine learning. <coughs> but the genetic algorithm results were actually pretty good. And, and, and one, I gave one student, the Chinese guy, he's much better at hand calculations than computer calculations. So, I, so the first paper on using genetic algorithms to find optimal bull sequences was by Dan Ledoff, who's an Israeli, but he's in California now. And uh, he found a couple of new bull sequences that nobody had found before, and he published. So I said, look, Chinese student, you'll use uh, uh, genetic algorithm and find some more and move it up. So he went away for way too long, and I thought, you know, he's having a hard time with the code. No code. He came back and he an found an analytic uh, group theoretical means that reproduced Lidar's results and all other possible results from this specific noise spectrum analytically. And I said, well, I can't be sad. Okay, so. So, you know, we were inspired by the genetic algorithm. He was inspired. He didn't want to do the computing code. He'd much rather do group theory. And so we have a paper where we show using group theoretical methods for this particular noise, we can find all possible whole sequences and breed them together in the group theory as opposed to the genetic algorithm and this kind of thing. So, but machine learning, we, we have students working on machine learning now. We're just at the end of year two, it's a five year project, so you know, getting the students up. To, the problem is they get up to speed on machine learning and they're immediately offered a job somewhere and they graduate and leave. And then I train the next ones, and same thing. It's a problem for you, not for them. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so I said, you guys need to learn machine learning and then they go, great, and then, and then they say, oh, I just got a job offer, I'm graduating in May, and they're gone. And they, then I have to train a new one. I have to find students who are smart that aren't going to take the job on This is like the Heisenberg uncertainty. If you're smart, you're going to take the job on right? okay, so. Right, so, and the dumb ones are not any good. Young lady. I don't have a question. I just want to I have another question. Oh, but, okay, wait, wait. wait so, actually, he, you've had more than him. So, <laughs> Uh, Something I didn't really uh, understand about the, this uh, concept of this prefacing, because you, you uh, mentioned that uh, it's caused by uh, noise from environment. But this is supposed to also decohere the, the qubit, not only change, right. coherently. Right, right, right. So I only mentioned dephasing because that's the easiest one to explain. Okay? And dephasing is much more like the spread of the Broly wavelength of the wave function. Okay? But you also get the similar effect from the coherence, of the, the wave function of the, uh, the vector that shrinks. And so because the, it gets in Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, I, I, since this is an introduction to quantum metrology, not the, the, the graduate level course, I, I thought I, the phasing is easy with the runners and everything, okay. But the pulse sequences work quite well on the coherence and stuff. Yeah, but, but it's not somehow a simple picture. the noise from the environment phases the qubit faster than the Correct. Yes, this was the guy who said, what's the difference between T2, T1 and T2, right? So the point is we can correct both. One, the phasing is T1, and the noise from the environment is T2, or the reverse, I forget. This T2 star, I'm going to what this is. But the same techniques, are, and so this is where so this is, you caught me, because I said there's a noise model for dephasing the noise model. For decoherence, there's a noise model. So you have to model the bad. Is it Markovian, non-Markovian, is it curved, is it, you know, this, the, so you write down the, the noise in the bath, okay, so where's the bath? So I have a cutic. So NB diamonds, one of the worst things in the NB diamond, this is what's causing the dephasing. But now, now I'm gonna push back a little bit, okay. So, what causes the dephasing in the NB diamond is not just the bro that that's such a smaller effect. NB diamond sits there, okay, and you would like the, the diamonds, all the carbons, to have spin zero, okay? But this is very expensive diamond, okay? So, and I, it, 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 the weighing ram would cost you a hundred thousand dollars as opposed to just ten. Because you have to, they ionically, they actually fabricate the diamond 
and then use this mass spectrometer to filter out the wrong mass carbon nuclei to only get the spin zero. They can get it down to 1% or 0 0.5. Each, when you go from 1 to 0.1, you pay an extra million. When you go to from uh, uh, 0.1 to 0.01, you pay an extra 10 million. So it, this is the problem. So the remaining guys have this, there are a lot of these spin ones floating around, okay? So, but my qubit is a spin one, okay? So here are these other spin ones in, in the background, okay? And uh, they interact with this kind of, and these spin ones, they do this weird thing at non-zero temperature. You can get rid of this by taking it down to zero Kelvin, okay? But that's also the So the, the point is, is that you have like these singlet states where this will happen, and it, it doesn't require almost any energy, right? Because there's no real... And so these things are happening all the time. So the spin bath is fluctuating. And that's the origin of the, the dominant phase. Okay? It's not decoherence. You know, I... I, I there's a pro it's it's really defaced. Okay. Maybe. Well, I, why? Now I have to think about this. I, I, because I use dephasing and decoherence interchangeably. It's, it's, it's decoherent. You're fine. It has the same effect. This is the first time I've heard, heard a distinction. I know. I know. This is this is. I usually so dephasing should happen even if the diamond is an empty space because the Schrodinger wave back experiments. But th then you get this dominant tensor that caused the same kind of effect at a much higher speed from the spin-spin interaction. So in any people in nuclear physics call this the phase. It looks just exactly like, but really it's deep weird to a couple of This is the difference in the language. Okay? And I, I walk between the quantum computing and the sensor people, and so sometimes I use debasing to mean the coherence. When I talk to you, and then when I talk to you, I don't need, need to make a difference. But the point is, is that now I have a, this, how fast are these spins flipping, okay? What is the frequency of this? So I Fourier transform, so this, this, my primary qubit is feeling these spin flips, and it drops off like one over R cubed, because magnetic spins are one over R cubed. So you write down a model for this, and then you Fourier transform it into frequency space. So these are flipping every few nanoseconds or whatever. So you now have a bath, you, know, you look at the spectrum and frequency, and you say these frequencies are bad, but you, know, but you have also a spectrum, it could be like this, or whatever. And then when you do the optimization, the pulse sequences, you actually look at the spectrum, and then you can convert the pulse sequences also from time into frequency space, and that's easier to analyze. And then I optimize the pulse sequences in frequency space to minimize the effects of this frequency dominating when I kill that person. That's what Ulrich did. It's like if his first term in the expansion killed the first one, the second one killed the second one, but it had a very particular noise. So, and, and again, just like uh, similar, because it looks like we phasing, a lot of people call it the phase. You can call it joy. Joy? Joy? Happiness. Joy. Uh, joy. Uh, joy. Roy, yeah, joy is a funny name and usually a, a girl's name. Also, he goes to class. It's like, you know, it's like a boy named Sue. Yeah, but, you know, we yeah, a boy named Sue, right? Or Pat. Pat is, you know, I have, and my mother was Pat, and my grandfather was Pat. Okay, so, you know, it's Patrick and Patricia. So, so because it looks like the phasing, but the critical thing is that, you know, I don't have no control over the, the early wave, but I do have control over the phasing or the coherence reduced by a noise band. And so the machine learning algorithm constructs. And you know, in the old days, all these pi pulses, they were delta functions with weight pi, or pi over two, okay? My pulse generator does not produce delta functions because they have infinite peak energy, okay? They, you go to the pulse generator guys and go, what can you make? We can make a square, and or up and down, or whatever, triangle, or yeah. And so, what are you talking to? You can make anything. Oh, so you want. Not an infinite height. Yeah, delta functions are really hard. Yeah. Delta functions no, are really hard. But you can make any shape. Yeah. Well, any shape, okay. <laughs> but not to infinite precision. No. Yeah. I mean, it depends on what you want to pay. Exactly. Okay, so <laughs> I go to the cheap guys and they go, we can make triangles and squares. And if you pay more, you can want to do it. So we can all get triangles and squares. But the area of the poles cannot be arbitrary. Because energy. 
and the height of the bolts get up there because that's the peak end. So you go to the bolt generator guys, and I'm optimizing for your bolt generator. How good can I do? This is my postdoc we are calling. He left, he, left, he left Israel to come to work with me. And his first paper was in physical, physical review letters, first author paper. Now the true story. Now I'm, I'm the chauffeur. Right? Are you driving me back to the The chauffeur wants to go home. Okay, so I have to finish the story, the embarrassing story. So, so we're writing this paper, and I said, well, we're going to send this to PRL. It doesn't have a PRL, then we can put it in PRL. And he goes, this is so simple. It'll never get into PRL. Why are we wasting our time <laughs> sending it to PRL? He goes, if this, and I go, I, look, I'm the boss now, because we're going to PRL. He goes, if this gets into PRL, oh. I am resigning from science. Hey. <laughs> so it got, it got into PRL first shot. Referee said, correct a couple of typos. And for the first time, he shut his mouth for 24 hours. And I will resign from science. <laughs> I have to lord this over you until one of us dies. <laughs> I'm very happy. What are you staying at? Ramada. It's here by. Oh, okay. Ten. What's the shot? It's, 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 it's a 20 minute walk. Just play at night. It's cold. In the summer, I would walk. And and you have a lot of things, right? Because the car is here. Uh, I have all the things I need. I left my, my nice jacket and my, my hood, but it's not so cold. It's not so cold. Let me back up. So you told Professor H. Eisenberg that yeah, he's going to give me a ride directly to the hotel from here. You're all right. From here? Okay. Yeah. So, so I take the bike now and tomorrow morning again. Again, the signal is okay. Yeah, it's been okay. Are you going to be on the roof again? Trample in a place else? I'm going to be I'm going to be I'm going to be תשמע, אבל אני הולך על ממד, אז אם הוא הכיל אותו, הולך ברגל. Monday and Tuesday night are best because yes. I don't have to teach them. Yes. So if the Elta people are not taking you, so just you and me. I have to meet with the Dahab Kats at 10.30 a.m. I'm talking about evening now. Yeah. Oh, on Tuesday. I have this will be, and we can celebrate with us the uh, 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 talk. Yes. Can I go from here? Bye, thanks. Right. Close. Oh. What a nice thing that I'm being a university professor, unlike it. In the scientist at a government lab that's going to give lectures. There's always some pretty young girl in the front row. The government lab is there. The youngest girl is 16 years old. Okay, the NASA government. Bye. You stopped the recording? He's giving your eyes. Bye. All right. Living. We will not. Oh. You are living well. Yeah. See you tomorrow. Bye. Good evening. Goodbye. Good evening. Ah. Good night. My leftover lunch is in a guy's office, but I don't need it. I'm not hungry. We can. I can take you first to Is it on the way? Uh, no, but that's. I don't need it. I don't need it. I. Oh, I'd be fine. I, I made the salad with all the heavy ingredients, and so it was a little too much. I could eat it for lunch tomorrow. The guy's office is so cold, it's like a refrigerator. <laughs> Should be fine. Ugh. It's one of your sons. My son, not one. <laughs> you, have, you only have one. Well, then it's true. It's one of your sons. I think uh, Howell has four boys. Mm -hmm. It was good to see him. He was very tired. He just got back from Snowbird. From what? Snowbird, the conference in the ski resort. Oh. You know who invited me? 
uh, Scully always invites me, but uh, Lu Chaoyang is running some session, and I don't know what, but he invites me. I said, no, I'm giving a course in Israel. And the, the thing is, it's snowbird, we have meetings in the morning, and then at lunch, you're supposed to go ski, but I don't ski. You know, I, remember, I used to try to ski, but I could never get off of the very beginner slope, because it goes from babies, beginner, to infinitely hard, okay? There's no in, in, intermediate beginner, right? Okay, so if I would just go around on the same loop, I got bored. And it's very expensive. Yeah, yeah, it's very expensive. Yeah. Let me go to the toilet quick. Yeah. Because I didn't go to the toilet on the last break. Thinking I would only talk for a half hour, but it was interesting. I had 60 slides. Last By the week. way, you have three hours for of 45 minutes. So you don't have to finish at 6. You have to finish at uh, oh, six, six, 7. 6.45. Six, six yeah. yeah. But, but, you know, I had, I, last time I finished right at 6.45. The same number of and this time I finished it since 30, so somehow I was even not talking and I get along, I think, better than me and Haggai, because we have the same sense of humor, and, you know, Haggai is always worried about very little things, and Katz is like, you want to talk physics, or I can take you to the, the library where they have the oldest copy of Maxwell's treatise, an original, and he goes, I go, he, I would, he goes, I would much rather see that than go see Herod's tomb. He says, I know the librarian, you can hold it. So that, for me, is a very nice thing. You have also all the uh, Einstein uh, notebooks here. Yeah. Know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, the, the big thing is most of them private. They have locked up for 15 years after that. So he died in 15 years.